Okay, hey everyone. Just making sure we're start set up right. One sec. And should be switching over to mine in just a second. There we go. Nice infinite cascade there for us. Okay, cool. Fire off a message. So, Twitter knows we've started. And, <coughs> let's dive in. Alright, so, come to, to Chris Streaming Code. I'm Chris. I'm going to stream some code. Um, so, last stream we wrapped up the work for on the website for now. So, not perfect, not super pretty. Uh, it's good enough for now. It'll serve the purpose of basically having a place to put our projects going forward. So now, let's start with the first project. So, this stream is really going to be, uh, or this channel, rather, is I want to do a series of projects and stuff, you know, help people learn to code, but do it a little bit differently than um, maybe your more traditional classes. Instead of trying to master a concept when it's first introduced, I'll introduce a concept, kind of talk about it for a bit, and then we'll kind of move on, but what we'll do is we'll start using that concept. And through repetition, you'll start to learn the ins and outs of it. So instead of being like, this is a string, here's everything you could possibly want to know about a string. Here's an integer. Here's everything you could possibly know about an integer. We'll just be like, here's a string. It's a bunch of characters. Here's what it looks like. Moving on. And then we'll keep going like that. And hopefully, just simply by the repetition, you know, seeing it over and over and over and over and over and over again, you know, the important concepts you'll see constantly, you'll be able to pick things up that way. If you have any questions at all, you know, if you're live with me, you know, fire them off in the chat. I'll be answering them there. If you're not live, you know, leave a comment wherever you're seeing the video. Hit me up on Twitter, you know, what have you. Uh, always happy to help. Always happy to answer questions. All right, so let's get started. Um, so first thing we really need for progr for doing programming is an IDE. Yes, you can use something like Notepad, good old Notepad, um, but really you want an IDE. IDE stands for Integrated Development Environment. Uh, so basically it's a fancy text editor with a bunch of other tools that make coding much easier. Uh, my favorite, which I use on the stream, it's by JetBrains, it's WebStorm. Uh, JetBrains actually has a whole bunch of different products that are very similar, but they're focused on different languages. Um, so, do, 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 do. so we can see here, here's a list of them. Um, we have like, uh, so here's WebStorm we use. That's for like HTML, JavaScript stuff. RubyMines for Ruby, Rider C Sharp, PyCharm is Python, PHP, Storms for PHP, Idea, Java, <coughs> so on and so forth. You get the idea. Uh, all their tools look very similar. And in fact, you can even get a master set, which gives you all of them, um, which is what I maintain because I tend to hop languages around a lot. Um, this is really, WebStorm is a really great one to start with. Um, only problem is it does cost money. For if you're an individual, uh, it's 60 to start, and they'll give you updates for the first year. And if you keep your subscription going, 47 and then 35 for the second and third year, or and 35 forever. What's cool though is say you buy the $60 one and you don't want to keep paying, you still get access to the last update you had access to. You don't get, don't get any additional updates. Uh, there's also a 30-day trial. And then also, for a bunch of you, you might qualify for, if you go into special offers, there's a truckload of different special offers that either can give it to you for free or a discount. So if you're interested um, in getting WebStorm, uh, read through the special offers. See if any of them apply. Like if you're a student, you can probably get it for, for free. Uh, or if you're a teacher for free, uh, if you only want to work on open source product projects, uh, you can probably get it for free. A whole bunch of different ways to get it for free or cheap. Um, so check it out. If you don't want to shell out any money, or can't shell out any money right now, no worries. There's also lots of free options. My current top pick for free options right now is Visual Studio Code. It's actually by Microsoft. So Microsoft makes a very not free 
a product called Visual Studio. Uh, right there. Um, Visual Studio is kind of like the industrial, is a big industrial strength IDE. Um, Visual Studio's code is free and lightweight, but it definitely gets the job done, and it has a whole bunch of nifty plugins and tools and stuff. So uh, both of these are awesome. Um, some other ones that are really popular, uh, you have more, um, uh, what do we call it? I don't want to call it simple. Um, maybe streamline is a good word. Uh, like um, Sublime, um, Notepad++, TextPad, pretty much any text editor. Uh, that doesn't do fancy things. Don't try to use like Microsoft Word. You'll have a terrible time because they'll keep throwing garbage in your stuff that you don't want. But any basic text editor is going to work well. Uh, there are even some people that use like Vim and Nano, which is command line text editor. They're a little bit crazy in my opinion, but hey, whatever works. Ultimately, it doesn't matter which IDE you use, uh, especially for web and Java, pretty much, or JavaScript, sorry. Uh, well, even Java. Pretty much any programming language can work in any IDE if you set it up right. Um, but yeah, so these are my two picks. Um, okay, so what we're going to do with our project is we're going to make a simple game today. And let's just fire up Photoshop real quick, and I'm just going to kind of draw out with my oh-so-epic mouse on mouse Photoshop drawing skills. Uh, if you aren't very good at sarcasm, that was sarcasm. Uh, <laughs> so basically, our game we're going to have our field, and this is. Kind of the closest game I could think of that is kind of sort of similar to what we're going to make is uh, Fruit Ninja. Uh, so Fruit Ninja game you have you might probably seen it, it was a real popular uh, mobile app. You know, fruit come on the screen and it's ha they like come up and come down. And you're supposed to slash them with your finger before that. We're going to do kind of sort of something similar, but it's not quite the same and it's not really going to have any of that physics. So what we're going to do, we're going to have our little shape in the middle and it's gonna just follow our mouse around so if we drag our mouse our our shape will move and then we're gonna have other shapes for now I say shapes because we're gonna start with shapes we could probably put some images in there um, down the line to make it cooler looking but I usually when I'm working on the mechanical bits I like to just use simple shapes because they're really easy to put in there and then I can focus on the the part that I want to focus on, which is the actual mechanics. Um, so we're going to have shapes, so we'll probably make our guy a square, and then the shapes will be, or sorry, our guy will be a circle, the shapes that will be coming in will be a square. And they're going to come in from all side and they're sides, and they're just going to kind of stream across the screen in any, from any direction. And we're, the goal will be we have to hit them with ours, so we'll just drag our mouse over them. We'll start out slow, so it'll be really easy and stuff, you know, one will come in, it'll kind of go slow. And then we'll make the game speed up as we go along. So eventually you should get to a point where you just have so many shapes that you can't hit them all. And then we'll make it so you lose the game if you miss X number of shapes, uh, probably 3, 5. We'll play around with the exact number. Uh, cool thing about coding, it's really easy to change your mind. I do it all the time. Um, you know, usually it just takes a couple line tweaks of codes and, you know, your game's changed. So, that's going to be what our, our game is going to be. Um, to make life easier and to let us use some of the latest and greatest stuff, so we're going to be using JavaScript. JavaScript's been around for a while, but in the last several years it's kind of been having, um, it it's gotten way more modern real quick uh thanks to thanks in large part to both browsers being much more standards compliant and much more willing to update real quick and also thanks to babel so babel is this nifty uh thing they call themselves a javascript compiler uh basically what it does is it take lets you use the latest and greatest syntax and it'll translate into older syntax that things are able to understand. Because sometimes features won't be quite ripe, won't be in browsers yet. And so um, you can't use them directly. But with Babel, we can write our code to use them. And then um, Babel will translate it for us. So really cool. Um, but to make use of Babel, we really need a... Uh, a, what's called a build pipeline and basically that's just something that takes your code and it does something to it uh, in our case it's going to run Babel to transpile and it's also going to copy some stuff over for us and then makes it so we can run that in the browser real easy uh, so um, in our last streams we basically we set up a build pipeline um, with for our website so I took that build pipeline out and I kind of stripped it down and I created this new project here called Base Web Template. 
and it I marked it as a template so you can actually come in here and if you just hit this handy button all you have to do is type in a name and it'll copy all of these files over for you so you could get started with that um, so this this uh, site's called github here and it y uses a technology called git which is what's called a uh, source control uh, system a version source control um, and th that's basically a fancy word for saying it lets you kind of uh, share and keep track of your code real easy uh, we won't dive too much into the into git stuff just yet um, simply because that's a little more advanced than basics and we're trying to go basic basic so for now though <coughs> excuse me I'm just gonna I hit template I'm gonna type in a repository name so we're gonna call this um, Oh, I don't know. What should we call this project? Let's call it. Um, I don't know. Naming's always the hardest thing. That's usually why I make up a terrible name and then I think of something better later. <coughs> <coughs> Let's just call it. I don't know. Shape Smack Game for now. Why not? <coughs> and I'm not going to worry about a description. I'm going to hit repository. So this guy is making me a, uh, is copying over my thing here. So now I have my files here. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. Um, so now I'm going to go, and I'm going to do what's called clone in Git parlance. Basically, ju that just means I'm going to download it. Um, so I open up clone and download. I hit this link to, all right. I selected all this text and I hit copy or you can hit that can uh, handy button and it'll copy it. And then I'm going to go over to WebStorm and I'm going to hit check out from version control git. And I'm just going to paste in the URL and it's going to make a project for me there, a folder. I'm going to hit clone. Would I like to open it? Yes, I would. Okay. So, now I have my build pipeline here. Um, so, Pretty much any project should have a README in it, and the README is usually where you can go to get your documentation, how to use it and stuff. README also shows up here, um, so you could read you could read through this if you want. I don't need to read through it right now because I wrote it. Um, all we need to know right now is that we're going to run npm install and npm run dev. So, um, sorry, let me back up just a tiny bit. If you're brand new, you're also going to need a technology uh, program called Node.js. Node.js is basically a framework. Oh, here we go. We'll use their description. Node.js is a JavaScript runtime built on Chrome's V8 JavaScript engine. All right, that's very technical. Basically, it's a thing that lets you. Normally, JavaScript runs in your browsers on websites and stuff. Uh, Node.js lets you run it directly on your computer, just like any other program. Uh, so, if you don't have Node.js already, you can go ahead and hit the download button, download uh, your Node.js here, and then you should be all set. And then, so we're going to run, and so in um, IntelliJ, I hit Terminal here. If you're using Visual Studio Code, uh, it also has a terminal window. I think it's View Terminal. You go to View at the top and then Terminal, or it might be Console. Um, if you're using others, they may have a built-in terminal. If you don't have a built-in terminal, uh, you can also open just a regular separate command prompt. So on Windows, uh, if you hit the Windows key or hit your click your Start menu, type cmd, hit enter. This is a command window, so you could type your commands here. You don't even see this text here, it's the same here. So it's basically the same thing, just a different spot. If you're on um, Mac or Linux, it's terminal. Uh, same deal, basically. Just go find terminal um, and start that up. Um, so another thing, we're going to run npm install. So npm is a program that will get installed along with Node. It stands for Node Package Manager. Uh, basically what it does is it's a handy way to download other people's um, small projects or modules that will work with your program to let you do various things. Um, so Babel, for example, uh, this guy that I was talking about, that's one example of a module. Um, so we have, um, you know, Babbles here, all kinds of uh, different uh, code you can download here. And that saves us from having to write literally everything from scratch. So I have this package.json file here, which has the dependencies I want. We have dev dependencies and dependencies. 
And so when I run npm install, it's going to download these guys for me. That way I'm all set for that. Um, the difference between these two, this one is used when you're actually running your program. The dev dependencies are used when you're developing your program. Um, so that's the real difference. That's the only real difference between the two. They'll both get downloaded when you do npm install. So now that I download my uh, dependencies, I'm just going to run npm run dev. And that's a, so we, in our package.json, we also have a bunch of scripts I wrote here. Little, uh, so dev's going to fire up basically everything we need in one shot. And you can ignore this little warning. It happens the first time there. And if it's a little scary, um, just run it again, it'll go away. But you don't have to run it again. So now what this guy's doing is it's watching all of our code and all of our files. And anytime we change something, it will rebuild everything so basically it'll run Babel over them and get them all translated for us and it'll also copy over our images and stuff which will be in our and uh which will be in our public folder so and then we can go to localhost 8000 and i can we can take a look at those okay so nothing here but it loaded up uh, we can actually, so if you right click and hit inspect, you can pop up uh, if you're using Chrome, which I highly recommend for development. You can use any of them that you like. Chrome is my favorite by a pretty significant margin, uh, but they all have pretty similar feature sets at this point. So if you right click, hit inspect, it'll open up the Chrome development tools. And then we can, this gives us a bunch of different things. So we can see our HTML, we can see our console. Um, we can see files it loaded, um, et cetera, et cetera. So I'll flip over to network real quick and I'll refresh the page and we'll see. So it downloaded our files for us. So it downloaded our index.html, which shows up as localhost here. Downloaded our JavaScript and our CSS file. And you can ignore this uh, little thing. Fav icon is the icon that shows up here. This project doesn't have one, so it keeps trying to download it every single time. Um, but we can just ignore it. It doesn't hurt anything. Um, so yeah, so once we're up and running and happy, and just to show you what this looks like if you're not up and running and happy, if I kill this, which, by the way, to kill a uh, program, it's control C. If you need to kill the program for Windows, you also have to hit Y or N. Um, Mac and Linux, you don't have to hit Y and N. But, uh... Control C will exit out for you, so you can uh, restart or type new things. So I'm gonna I hit Control C, so it all shut down. So just to show you what it looks like if things are not happy, you'll get site can't be reached. So if you get site can't be reached, you know it's not up. If you get a white screen, you're good to go. Okay, so for the JavaScript game, uh, well for any website, you have a couple different types of files. You have your HTML file, which is um, which is kind of the, it's basically the structure of your website. Um, and then you have CSS, which is your style sheet. Uh, we'll probably be touching these a little bit, but we're not going to go too in-depth on those guys because we want to mostly focus on the JavaScript side. So JavaScript, we have JavaScript files. And in this case, we're not really going to worry about server. Everything we're going to do is going to be in this client folder. So server is what's running kind of behind the scenes. And then client is what the files that we are sending to the user's browser that they're actually like downloading and running them in in their website. Uh, so pretty much everything we get we're at, gonna play with is uh, in our JavaScript. So uh, let's not worry about our in, our HTML and our CSS just yet. Let's go play with um, our index.js. So uh, just to get started, uh, let's go ahead. And we'll do console.log hello world. And what console.log is going to do is it's going to output to this console here. And it's just going to output whatever we give it. So we can see hello world. So yeah. And you also notice that just changing that and flipping over here and refreshing the page, which I've been using control F. You can also hit this guy or hit control R. Uh, or sorry, I th think I said control F. F5. Or you can hit control R or you can hit this guy to refresh. Um, those all, they all, all three of those do the same thing. Um, when I refresh, it'll reload my changed code, and we can see here. And our build pipeline is taking care of translating it for us. So what's actually happened 
And if we watch, so if you watch down here, I'm gonna make a change and save it. You can see it started running some stuff, and what it and it will keep running things unless it drags something. And what it's doing is it's moving, it's copying things over into here, and it's translating them for us. Now the console log doesn't really need translation, but if I come in here and I do um, something like this guy I think still gets translated. <coughs> uh, let's see if it, that gets translated. Yeah, so you can see here it actually translated a whole bunch for us. And we're never going to edit the dist files directly. So what you usually want to do in your IDE, and it, it's a little different how you do it in each IDE, um, but in IntelliJ, or sorry, WebStorm. If I say IntelliJ, that's also web, that I'm referring to WebStorm. Uh, I use IntelliJ all day at work, um, and it's pretty much the same program, just focused on a different language. So, um, but yeah, I'll try to remember to say WebStorm so I don't confuse anyone. But anyway, sorry. So we're going to right click on the folder, we're going to go to mark directory as excluded, and then it's going to turn orange and it's going to get this background here. That just lets us know that that's not really code we want to touch. Same with node modules, we're never really going to go mess with anything in node modules. That's where all those pro all those pack, uh, modules it downloaded for from NPM, that's where all of them live. So we're not going to play with either of those folders, so we'll just ignore those for now. But our build pipeline is translating it and getting it in there. And then when we run it, it is actually coming out of here. Um, sometimes these will also be called build folders, um, especially in different languages like Java and C Sharp, C++. Those all prefer to call it build instead of dist. Um, but uh, uh, Node usually uses dist, so that's why I use dist here. Okay, so. And, all right, so we'll get rid of that. All right, so console.log. Hello world. All right, so console.log is a function, which we'll talk more about functions in a second. But a f it's a function that basically is just used to output stuff. So console.log is definitely your friend when you're trying to figure things out, because you can just output it real quick right there, and you'll be able to um, see what's going on. Um, and so that's going to be very handy for you as you're going on, because then you can also like, you know, put like, you know, what's the value of something I'm doing and stuff. Because there'll be bits of, there'll be times where you know things will get calculated, and we're not quite, we're not able to just look and tell what's going on. So console.log will give us a little insight. There's other ways, but console.log is kind of the, it's somewhat the old school way, but it's also one of the easiest and fastest ways. So I still use it all the time. Okay, cool. So. Now then, let's go ahead, let's set up a couple little things so we can um, get our game going. So let's pop over to our index.html file real quick. And we're just going to add, so between our body tags, so when you have this left angle bracket or less than sign, and then some element and greater than, that's called a, referred to as a tag in HTML. Sometimes they're accompanied with a closing tag like this guy, which is slash and the same name here. And sometimes they have uh, attributes in in the opening tag like this guy does um, and they do different things but like I said we're not gonna worry too much about the HTML but let's put some put a new line in between our body and then we're gonna tab over so you can hit tab you can also do four spaces uh, tabs much easier um, and then we're going to do a left angle bracket we're going to do div which stands for um, Oh, what does this stand for? Division, I think. Hopefully. <laughs> uh, and then we're going to do an attribute, which is called ID. And we're going to put root in there. And we're just going to put it like that. That's all the HTML we're going to have to do today in there. So uh, all this is doing is we're, we're going to make something to do a hook. So when you do an ID, that's a way to be able to refer to it. So we're going to be able to go to our JavaScript now and find this element that has an ID of root. So, pop over here and we'll say uh, document.querySelector root. Okay? So, document.querySelector is a function again. It takes a string, which is a selector, and then whenever we ref have this hash he tag here, 
that means that we're looking for some ID, and then it's whatever's after here. So ID root is what we're looking for, which will be that guy. And um, you know, it, it doesn't have to be named root. It could be named Cookie Monster, and as long as this guy over here is named Cookie Monster, it's going to find it still. And if they don't have the same name, it won't find it. Um, okay, so we'll go at that. And then let's real quick, let's come over here. Let's grab this guy, and we're going to drag it down and put it right below there. Uh, the reason we're doing this is we want to make sure that this guy exists before this guy runs. There are different ways to handle that. This is the simple way. Again, we don't want to worry too much about the HTML right now because we want to make a game. So um, basically, we just we want to put it down there. That way it runs after. And then so we can do use console.log. And just like we put some text and 4 plus 4 in there, we can also put the results of other functions in here. Let's have to make sure. So we can see here it found it because it output it for us. If it didn't find it, like if I had a typo or something, we'd get null. Null means nothing. You don't have anything there. You didn't find anything. Um, so change it back to root. Okay, so what we're going to do now is we're going to make, so we can get rid of the console log, so we know we got that text right. We're going to make what's called a variable. So a variable is essentially just a it's a mm, I think probably the simple but still technical way to describe it so it's a way to reference some information you can kind of think of it as like a, it's a container to hold information although it's not really a container it's more like the address to the container um, but basically it's our way to hold things in JavaScript we have two ways to define variables well we actually have three there's var uh, and then s some variable name, so like a or my variable or cookie monster or whatever. And then you can put some value to it. So like now the variable cookie monster equals one. And I can output, I can do a console log and put cookie monster in here. And we should be able to see, boom, cookie monster equals one. So it outputs one there. Now var, and I'm getting a squiggly line from IntelliJ because it's telling me don't use var. Var is old and not recommended anymore. I only mention it to you because you may see it in other people's code, but you should really never, ever, ever, ever use var um, unless you're like having to code something for some really old thing, which I hope you never have to. There, it's not fun. Okay, so normally we're going to use one of two options. We're going to use either let or const. We'll use Elmo since cooking where you kind of on a Sesame Street kick for some reason. So the, both of these will create a variable, and we can output both of them like this. So one and two. And you can also, just FYI, you can actually put multiple variables in one console.log and separated with a comma, and it'll output them with a space separated between them too. That's real handy if you have like four variables you want to dump out. P put them in one, that way it's less typing for you. Um, so, the difference between these two now is when you use let, you're allowed to change what this value equals. If you use const, you're not allowed. So, for example, so up here, Cookie Monster is equal to 1. I can change Cookie Monster by simply saying variable name equals some new value. I just leave off the let. I, you only do the let or const the first time. And now if I output Cookie Monster again, we'll get a 5. So Cookie Monster actually changed. Um, Elmo, though, because Elmo is a const here, I can't change Elmo. If I try to change Elmo, I'm going to get yelled at. In fact, IntelliJ is warning me right here, too. But if I go to my browser, well, you're going to get a error. Elmo is read-only. So it's saying, I can't change Elmo. Um, and you can actually, whenever you get an error like this, you can It'll give you what's called a stack trace here, which kind of tells you what code's going on. So I can click. If I click here, I'm going into um, uh, some. What is that from? Is that actually from Babel? Interesting. Um, but yeah. Uh, but if I click here, I can go to the the code I'm typing, so I can get the right number. So it's telling me in index.js, and if I mouse over it, it gives me the whole path, so I can see it's source client index.js. Line 7, that's what this number after here means. 
is where my error is, so I can use that check them. So that's the difference between our variables. Beyond that, they're, they both work identical. That's literally their only difference. Um, when you name a variable, a variable can really be named anything uh, as long as it follows a couple rules. It can't start with a number, so like 1 ABC, no bueno. Um, it has to start with a letter, or it can start with an underscore. Uh, the, inside the variable, you can have any letters, numbers, underscores, and then there's a handful of symbols that are allowed. Um, I don't know them all off the top of my head. Dollar sign is definitely one that's allowed. Um, actually, that may be about the only one that's allowed, aside from underscore. Uh, yeah, actually, that may be it. Um, so yeah, basically you can use these. No hyphens, no spaces, no blah blah blah. Um, when you name them, they can be short, but usually you want them to be more descriptive. So for like, um, if we're going to keep track of like players' lives, we're not just going to use a variable called p. We're going to use a variable called players' lives. And usually when you name it, you name when you name a variable that is multiple words, use what's called camel case. So like when I did Cookie Monster here, Cookie Monster is two words. So I can't have a space in the variable name. So what I did was, I so like if this was how I would normally type it out, I get rid of the space and I capitalize um, the first letter of each word other than the first one. So like if I wanted to do like um, some ridiculous name like um, a really long variable name with multiple words, you can see I am just capitalizing all of them except the first one. Uh, that's usually that's the normal convention for variable names. Um, if you were, and that's called camel casing again. Uh, if you were to start it with a capital letter, that's either called capital or capital case or Pascal case. Uh, we don't use that for variable names because we use that for other things. And by keeping them different, it makes it easier to tell when you're looking at things. Okay, is this a variable name or is it something else? Um, so. Camel case, use letter const, let if you want it to change, const if you don't. Okay, so let's go ahead and we want to get our game going. So we're going to use what's called the canvas to draw our game to, so we need to create that canvas. So this canvas, its variable is not going to change, so I'm going to do const. I'm going to name it canvas because that's what it is. Then I'm going to use a function called document dot quit, uh, sorry, create element. So document is um, one of a handful of kind of top level elements. Document really refers to your whole kind of page and it has a handful of handy functions in it. Uh, what's cool is if you do dot on things in an IDE, it'll give you a list of kind of all the functions that are available. You can see these crossed out ones. Those means they're deprecated, which means they still work, but you shouldn't use them because in the nearest future, they're not going to work anymore. They're going to go away. So usually when you want to get rid of something, you deprecate it for a while, and then eventually you remove it. So try not to use anything crossed out. Um, we're going to use query element. And you can also, <laughs> if you are inside parentheses, you can hit control P, and it's going to tell you, it's going to show you what parameters it wants and um, what types they are. So we can see here, we have two lines here. That means I have two different possible options for what to give. So I can give a tag name, which is either a string or a key of L HTML element tag name map, whatever that is. And then I can optionally give it options. And I know I can optionally give it because if you see after the word options as a question mark, that means it's optional. Um, and so those are called parameters. The things you give to a function are called parameters. Um, so in my ca our case, we're just going to give it a tag name and we're going to give it a string. So a string is basically just a string of characters. Uh, a string can be either um, done with single quote, double quote, or backticks. And these two are completely 100% identical. Uh, which one you use is mostly a matter of pre preference. In JavaScript, it seems like the winner is single quote, uh, so that's usually what I use. The only time I use double quote is if I need to have a string that has the same quote. So like Chris's game 
has a single quote in there, and these need to be in pairs, and it gets all confused because now it thinks this is this, the, this is the string, and it doesn't have a clue what this is. If I use a double quote here, I can safely put the semicolon in, or the sorry, single quotation mark in there. Um, vice versa, if I have a uh, if I want to use a single double quote inside, I can use single quote. You can also do what's called escaping, like that, where you put a slash in front of the symbol, and then it knows that it's not a pair, but that looks pretty ugly. So I usually will just use the the uh, the opposite of the one I'm using. But usually I'll go single quote. This guy is a little bit different. This guy is called template string, and it has a couple interesting features. So these two strings can't have blank lines in between. If I try to do that in IntelliJ, it's smart enough, it'll turn it into two different strings and put a plus sign in between, so it'll combine them. This guy, though, I can have two different strings, and this actually is like all parts. So if I console log the C right here, log C, I'm going to get canvas. Um, so that's one of its nifty features. The other nifty feature is if you do inside of it dollar sign curly bracket, and IntelliJ automatically put this curly bracket, the closing curly bracket for me. And then I do a variable name. So like A is a variable I have right now. It'll actually put that um, variable inside of my string. So we can see that's the canvas from A, and then it has the rest of it unchanged. So that's a template string. So you can also do the same thing by like adding two strings together. And that's kind of the same as this guy, but this guy t usually turns out more readable. So I usually use t I usually use this if it's just a boring old string with no new lines or variables added or what. If I'm going to add variables to to it, or I'm going to want new lines in it, I go with a template string. And then this guy pretty much only if I want a that single quote in my text. So those are our three ways to do strings. So, um, and it's called a string because it's a string of characters. Uh, so that's how you can remember that. Um, so, back to our canvas. We're going to give it string of canvas. So this right here is the element name. So just like the elements here were like body and div, I'm creating an element called canvas, except I'm creating it on the JavaScript side. So I'm creating my canvas, and then I'm also I'm going to go ahead and put this root in a variable. So I just copy and pasted that. I'm going to put it up here, root. So now I have my root that I selected here, and then I created a new canvas element here. So now what I'm going to do, I'm going to do root dot um, add child. No, sorry, append child. And uh, we've used this dot a couple times now. What this dot means is that I want to use this function or this value uh, off of this guy. So here I've been using query selector and create element which belong to document. Now I'm using a pen child which belongs to root. So usually when something belongs to it, it's going to affect it in some way. So in this case what we're going to do, a pen child canvas, this is actually going to add the canvas to the root element. So now if I refresh my page back here, can't see it because it's all white, um, but if I inspect element, actually you know what, let's do this. Let's go to our CSS and we're not going to worry about CSS just yet, but let's give our body a background. So we're going to do a body block, and then we're going to use a CSS style background, and we're going to give it 000, which is black and hexadecimal, uh, hexadecimal shorthand. Um, and if I refresh the page, whoop, my canvas is black too still, because we haven't filled in our canvas. But if I do, and actually we can give canvas a background too. So canvas block, background, and we'll give this a white background in shorthand, which is FFF. Or, um, okay, so there we go. So we got our, so now we can see my canvas is on root. So that's that creating, a, I created the canvas and then I did the root. So now what we're going to do, we want our canvas to be a little bit bigger because we want our game to fit. Uh, and also I think a square play field might work best for this game. We can always change these. <coughs> excuse me. We can always change these things later. So uh, usually, when I'm still kind of in this early prototyping stage, I don't spend huge amounts of time uh, worrying about the little details like this. So let's just pick something. So 800 by 800 might work well. So there we go. 800 by 800. So I just made my canvas a whole lot bigger. Um, 
so um, the width for this is in pixels, which are basically um, the little dots that make up your monitor. Like if you put your face really close to your monitor, unless you have a crazy high resolution monitor, you should be able to see little squares on there. Each one of those little squares is a pixel. Um, so we're saying take up 800 pixels width and height, and that's what this guy's doing. And I can also tell how big it is, because if I mouse over to my inspector, if you look down in the bottom left here, it'll say canvas 800x800, or if we look down here, it'll also show me 800x800. And then, just to make things a little prettier, let's go add some CSS again. Let's embody, do text align center, and that actually, it's a little bit of a misnomer, because it'll align more than text. Or, although actually, let's see. Let's actually not do it that way, though. Let's actually, sorry, pretend I didn't say that. Let's go to Canvas and do margin zero auto. And then let's do, uh, actually, 50%, 50%. And then let's do transform, translate, negative 50%, negative 50%. Should, yep, I messed up. Uh, bu -bu 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 -bu. Um. Hmm. Oh, why did you get so tall? That's odd. Oh, hang on. Sorry. <laughs> no, that part actually worked. Oh, um. Sorry. HTML, let me type this out and then I'll chat about it. Height, 100%, 100%, there we go. Nope. Still goofing something up. I'm doing wrong here. Because I didn't set that to zero, but that's not what I want. I want it to take up Hang on a sec. There's something else in the works playing here. Mm, yes, actually. That's weird. Um, oh, right. <coughs> we don't have any reset code here. Origin zero, padding zero, max height. Right, 100%. Yep, uh, actually, we can get fancier. Uh, 100 feet H, maybe. No. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Sorry, it's been a while since I've done this little bit. Ah, I'm not gonna worry about it. Not worth our time right now. So let's do. Let's rewind a little bit, and let's just stick with zero margin. I'm trying to put dead center, but I forget that code off the top of my head. So and oh, is that why? Display block. There we go. Actually, sorry, can't resist. One more stab at this thing, real quick. Uh, transform, translate, negative fifty percent, negative fifty percent. Sorry. <laughs> nope, no help. All right, never mind. All right, so basically, all we're doing here is we're setting the margin, which is based on either side, to zero for top and bottom, and then auto which will balance it out between left and right, so basically center. And then display block just changes how it calculates some things. We'll talk about that more in the future sometime. Again, I want to focus mostly on the JavaScript for this guy. Um, but that puts our game nice in the center there. Um, okay, so we have our space now. So now, <coughs> let's... Um, talk about um, how we get things on our canvas. So canvas is kind of a special element. Basically it's a blank space that we're going to draw things to. 
Um, so we're going to need to know how to position elements. So on a computer, so if you've ever been in a math class, uh, you'll know you have your classic Cartesian graph. So you have like this and like this with the arrows on all the sides and the little marks and stuff. And when you're in this side, both your x and y are going plus plus, so x is this way, x is left and right, y is up and down. When you're here, it's minus x plus y. Here is minus minus, and here is uh, what plus minus. So that's here Cartesian coordinates. When we're on a computer, it's kind of similar, except we're actually um, working in this space, really, except they're both positive. So on a computer, unlike Cartesian coordinates, on computer, and let's actually do this. Let's do papa. Shrink things down. Just can zoom in on them later. And then, all right, on a computer, we're basically, we just have the one coordinate system, which is like this. So as we go across, as we go along, plus, plus. So on a monitor, up here on the very far top left, that's zero, zero. And then my resolution is set to 1020, or sorry, 1920 by 1080. So that means that down here, in the very bottom corner, it's the X is 1920 and the Y is 1080. So on our canvas, it's similar. Zero will be the top corner of our canvas, and then because we're with height, with 800 and height 800, down here in this corner is 800, 800. So when we draw things, we're going to use those numbers to figure out where to put them on the screen. So let's go ahead. Let's make. Um, <coughs> our um, our circle. So if you remember, and I totally deleted it, so let's redraw it. So we're going to have a circle in the middle, and we're going to have squares coming in at us as enemies. So let's go. Let's we're going to draw our mouse. So for now, or our our character, which is just going to be a circle. So. To draw things on a canvas, first we have to get the context. So we're going to create a variable to hold that context. We're going to call that variable context because that's what it is. And then to get our context, we do canvas.getContext. And then here we have to get tell it either 2D or 3D, basically, or some stuff. Uh, it's actually not 3D, I guess. It's actually WebGL. We're definitely doing 2D. Um, so uh, canvas is cool. It can actually render 3D, but it's kind of complicated. Uh, so we won't be doing that today. Uh, maybe in the future, probably in the future. Okay, so we've got our context. Now to draw a, sh a circle, first we have to set a fill style. So the fill style is basically how is it going to fill it. There's a couple different options here. The simple one which we're going to use is we just give it a color as a string. So I'm going to give it, uh, let's see, what color do we want our character to be? So let's flip over to Photoshop and I'm gonna pop open this guy and actually that's a pretty good color that blue there so when we specify colors there's a bunch of different ways you can represent color on a computer uh, Photoshop is, color picker is actually pretty cool uh, showing of them because it actually shows you pretty much all the major ways so RGB which is the ones down here this is one of the most common or hex which is this guy these are the these are the two most common on computers you can also do HSB, which stands for Hue Saturation Brightness. And so it Hue Saturation Brightness, you have, it's actually degrees around this kind of imaginary circle of color. And then you have how much, what percentage of saturation and what percentage of brightness. That's another way. Um, you'll sometimes see that in more advanced, like 3D things. We can technically use it ourselves. Uh, but we're going to stick with uh, hex code for the most part. And then uh, LAB is, I think the L is luminance. And then A and B are just like random variables. This is, a, this is kind of a very scientific way of describing it. Uh, yeah, 
Don't really know much beyond that. I've never had to use LAB in practical. And then CMYK, which stands for cyan, magenta, yellow, and black, because K black totally starts with a K. Um, there is a reason for that. I don't remember off the top of my head. Um, this guy is actually used for printing. Uh, so on computers, we are mixing light. On your monitor, we're mixing light. So we're actually mixing red, green, and blue light to get our colors. If you turn all three of those lights all the way up, which the all the way up number is 255, you get white. If you turn them all the way down, you get black. So you can see right here. If you do somewhere in between, you get somewhere in between. Or like if we turn all the red, red all the way up and keep these two off, we get pure red, etc., etc. You can kind of play around with them. We can see, you know, as I change things, it'll change those numbers for us. Um, so we're mixing light. When you print, uh, which isn't directly related to game, but good to know. When you print, you aren't mixing light, you're mixing pigment. So instead of red, green, blue, you mix uh, cyan, magenta, yellow, which you may have learned in art class, um, uh, blue, red, yellow are your primary colors. Cyan, magenta, and yellow, it turns out, are a little bit better for printing with. Uh, you get more true representation of color. So, but yeah. Uh, for now, though, we're just going to worry about this guy. So we're going to take this hex code. I'm going to just going to copy it because we're going to make our character blue. Uh, I'm going to come over here, and then hex codes are always, almost always, represented with pound sign, and then the number, um, and the whether they're uppercase or lowercase doesn't matter. But I always like to make mine all uppercase because, I, for whatever reason, I think it looks better. Um, don't have to use one or the other necessarily, but it is good to be consistent. So if you always do uppercase, always do uppercase. If you always do lowercase, always do lowercase. Don't make a match because then it just looks funny. Um, and then with these colors, basic, this is actually a direct translation of RGB. So R, uh, so um, the normal numbers we use are base 10. So we count uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 are digits. We have 10 digits. Um, and then if you go to 10, you're now at two digits. So you reset your ones column, and then you add, add a number to your tens column. Um, hex code is base 16. So we actually use, we use uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, just like decimal. And then we add A, B, C, D, E, F. So we add six more to the original, so that gives us up to 16 different numbers, 16 different digits. And then there's some math, which we won't worry about right now, but uh, you can, that lets you translate from a base 10 to a base 16. So all hexes is these RGB numbers translated to base 16 and smushed together. Um, so yeah. And mo a lot of IDs, whenever you do a color, I'll show you this handy little color square so you can tell what color it is. Okay. So we got a color for our fill style, and then we're also going to set a stroke style. So fill is inside, stroke is a border around it, if we want. Um, and we're going to do here, let's go 333. Three, three. Uh, so 333 three, three is almost black, it's a kind of a very dark gray. Um, and in hex, in web-related stuff, at least, if your pairs of numbers, if all three pairs of your numbers are the same digit, so like if I had like A, A, B, B, C, C, I can get rid of one of those, and then I can do shorthand. I can shorthand. So this and A, A, B, B, C, C are the same thing. So in my case, I'm going to do 3, 3, 3. So that's all threes, basically. So it's a kind of nice dark gray. So that'll be our border. So now I'm going to do... Um, context dot for circles it's a little funny um, how we have to do it we'll begin a path and then we do context dot move to and so this is going to be the center point of where we want to move so for now I'm just going to hard code it to 400 400 that'll put us in the center of our play area then we're going to do context dot arc and arc is we give it the same value, then we give it how far to arc, how far to make, draw a circle in one line. So if you imagine, if you've ever used those um, compasses in math class, in like geometry class, 
they look like this guy here or these guys um, if you imagine one of those an arc is going to be so this guy actually does work in Cartesian coordinates like this guy if you imagine we put down our pencil at the point we gave or our the the one end of our compass here then we put down the pencil here on the line the arc is how far around in a circle we're going to go so if I wanted to do 90 degrees it would be like this it would give me a line like that or, or sorry 45 degrees or no not right, 90 degrees 180 uh, 270 or 360 the only catch here is it's in radians instead of degrees so normally a circle is 360 degrees it's also 2 pi around so that's it in radians so for now we won't worry about how to convert these um, <coughs> but we want to make a whole circle so we just need to know 2 pi for now and do note too that when you arc positive goes this way negative goes this way full circle again doesn't actually matter because we're going to go all the way around no matter which way we go so 2 pi and in um, in programming we can't really just put the pi symbol in here um, most programming languages will have some kind of way to get it in JavaScript we do math.py and pi is in all capital letters so um, I didn't mention this way of naming variables but you can also name variables with all capital letters and when you do all capital letters that's basically those should always be const and that's basically saying here's some value it never ever ever changes and it's some heart it's some value that I that's like always the same and always there so pi is one of those it's a constant um, so we're going to do 2 pi and then we're going to do start angle 0 um, end angle oh wait sorry I did it, totally did wrong this goes over here radius is how wide it is so we're going to do a radius of let's say 10 pixels for now so if you remember your your geometry class if you have a circle radius is the distance between the middle going out to the edge so our circle with a radius of 10 is actually going to end up being 20 wide total because it your diameter how wide the whole thing is is 2 rate 2 r 2 radius so we're going to end up with a circle of 20 so that may or may not be good but again don't like to spend too much time picking numbers because I can always come back and tweak those later. Those are easy to tweak. Okay, so start angle is zero. So again, if you imagine our Cartesian coordinates, we're going to start at zero, and then we're going to rotate two pi around. Okay, and you could technically also pass in. We're not going to this anti-clockwise boolean, which will flip it around, but we're not going to worry about that for now. Okay, so good. should be good there. So that's going to draw our line. Then so. If I run this now, it's not going to draw our line yet uh, because it's it's kind of made the thing, but I haven't told it to actually draw anything. So it's kind of right now remembering the shape, but it's not drawn it yet. To actually get it to draw, we're going to do canvas dot um, fill and or sorry context dot fill and context dot stroke. So this is going to have it whatever the last path I did, which is this guy it's going to fill it using my fill color and then when I call stroke it's going to stroke it put the stroke as well and usually you want to do fill first that way your strokes on top that way you get a nice clean border so there we go teeny tiny oh uh, so we have this funny little extra line in here that's because we don't need to move too far arc. there we go nice clean little circle and kind of tiny so we can keep playing with these. Anytime I have a variable that I think I want, might want to play, usually what I do is I'll turn it into a constant like I was just talking about. I usually keep them at the tippy top of wherever I'm using them. So we'll put them way up here at the top. I'm going to do, uh, let's call it player size. Because when we're going to think about it, we're not really, we don't necessarily want to think about it in mathy radius terms. We just want, okay, we want it 40 pixels wide. So we'll say player size 40. And then we're going to come down here, and instead of this radius, we're going to do player size. So remember, so the number of pixels wide, that's our diameter. So if we divide by 2, that's our radius, because that's what this guy wants. So that should give us one of 40. So that's better. We might play with it more in the future, but that's a good size for now. And then likewise, let's go ahead and let's turn these guys into constants too. OK, 
canvas width equals 800, const canvas height equals 800. And when you are naming constants that have multiple words, you're going to use an underscore because you can't really camel case this and this doesn't exist and looks terrible and please never do that. So really our only other option is to use an underscore. Um, so, and then we'll come swap out these numbers here. Canvas width, canvas height. And then, and so what's handy about doing that, so like this guy, I referenced the width here, and then this 400 is actually the width divided by 2. So now if I was to change my canvas size, if I just change it here, so like if we make it 500, I'll still end up centered because all the relative stuff is all calculated instead of being hard coded. I don't have to go find the 15,000 places that I put 800. So we'll do that. All right, so that's pretty good. So now we have our circle there. Uh, doesn't really do anything as hard coded sit in the center. This isn't exactly what I would call a game yet. So now we want to make this guy move. So this guy, if you remember from our little game design, it's going to follow our mouse. So what we're going to do with it, so we're going to, first we need to know where our mouse is. Uh, in JavaScript, the way we know where our mouse is, is we're going to add what's called an event listener. So an event is basically just something happened. Uh, so that may be mouse change, it may be a key press, it may be you're hovering over something, it may be you clicked on something, something changed, a whole bunch of events, you can even create your own custom ones. Uh, so the mouse event we want in this case is actually going to be mouse move. So that means the mouse moved. Um, they're really hard to figure out what they mean. Okay, so we're going to attach that event to canvas. So what we're going to do here, we're going to actually we'll put it down here after we've attached it to root. We're going to do canvas dot add event listener, and then our first parameter here is what type of event. And again, see we have two lines that shown here, so we have two options. We're going to use a simple one. We're going to give it a string, <coughs> and it's going to be mouse move. Our second value is a listener. So a listener is our function that's going to trigger when the event happens. So um, we haven't really talked about functions yet, uh, but a function, well, we've talked about using functions, so we've used functions. When we create a function, there's a handful of ways to create it. Kind of the classic way is like this, and this creates a function called a. And what happens is, so this is creating the function, and then if I call it like this, it whatever code I put in here is going to run. So like if I had this, I'd have my function here, and then I'd run it. So when I call, hit did this, it would run this code. And if I did if it like four times, it output that four times. And um, so it's a way to group code up so you can reuse it over and over again. You can also pass in what's called parameters. So if I do like, um, let's change this, we'll call our function say and we'll give it a message. So this is the name of the parameter and then I'm going to give it to here. So I'm going to call say and when you when you pass it in it's actually called an argument to the function so it's define parameters here and then you're giving it the actual argument. So I'm going to say cake and then Whatever I put here will get mapped to message. So in here, if I do message, then when this runs, it's going to say cake. And then if I ran this guy, it would say Bob. So um, do that. And you can also have multiple parameters. So like I could have like A, B, C, D, E. And then if I came down here and I was like cake, pie, cookie, candy, ice cream. Um, each one of these is going to map to the one, if you like count the spaces, that's the one it's going to be. So this is the first one, so it's going to go to the first one. Third one, third one, fifth one, fifth one. And IntelliJ is nice because it'll actually show you which value it's going to. So that's not a, this A, or this A, B, C, D, E here. That's not actually something I typed. That's something IntelliJ is like putting in there for me. So I can easily tell, okay, so in here, E is going to be ice cream. And then I could like console log each one of those and stuff. Uh, so function's really handy. Uh, this, like I said, is kind of the classic way to write a function. Still totally valid. Uh, you can also w do what's called an arrow function, um, which looks like this, and it's kind of the same deal. So actually, we'll, if we do our say function in arrow format, it would look like this. Um, 
So we still have our parameters. In this case, we have this arrow here, which is made up of an equal sign and a greater than sign, or right angle bracket. Um, and this would basically function the same exact way. So k okay, equals ice cream, blah, blah, blah. Um, there is a difference when it comes to scope, which we're not going to talk about just yet, because we don't need to worry about that just yet. Uh, but that's their big difference, is when it comes to scope. Um, in general, I tend to prefer arrow functions now versus uh, the classic functions because the scope is kind of easier to keep track of, but right now we don't have to worry about scope stuff, so uh, we'll talk about that when we get to that point. For now, though, we're just going to put an arrow function. So also, if you notice here, I was putting this arrow function in a variable, really. So really, I'm declaring a variable and I'm saying that variable is a function. That also means I can just use functions and pass them as arguments as well, which I'm doing here for now. We'll change this up later. Um, and then for now, let's just do, so when this event happens on Canvas, it's going to call this function. It's going to give me an event as its property. So the event has a whole bunch of things. So let's go ahead, we'll go ahead and run this. And we can see here, you can see all these mouse event streams. You get a lot of mouse events in, come in really quickly, so you'll get a lot fast. <coughs> and I so I look in here, I have all these different things going on in here. The thing I really want, though, is and let's do this. Boop. Is my offset x. So we actually we have a couple different ways that we can get the mouse in here. We have client x which is relevant, uh, uh, come back, relative to the overall screen, including where the canvas is positioned. So our canvas must be pushed over 260, or 236 in the X, so this way, and then eight down. Uh, we also have screen X, or, uh, no, sorry. Uh, page X is the same, oh, there it is, screen X. Screen X is relative to my entire monitor, so um, that means that if I can't, that means this distance must be 236, and then down must be 79. So that's Screen X. Page X is basically the same as Client X, so it's relative to my page. Um, and then the one we're going to use is Offset X. So this one is relative to the thing the event was on. So I booped this little spot here so I could tell that's zero, 0, right up there. So I got zero, 0, And then let's clear this. If you ever want to clear your console, this little button here, clear console, will clear it out for you so you can start from scratch. So if I boop this corner, boop, we should get something that's about 800 by 800 for offset X and Y. Yeah, so I missed the dead corner by a little bit, but you can see we pretty much, that's what we got. So we're going to use offset X and Y. So what we're going to do with that is instead of having these hard-coded numbers here, let's create some let variables. And usually you want to try to create your variables up at the top here, and in fact this guy should be created at the, uh, moved up to the top too. You want to generally group your variables up at the top because it makes it easier to keep track of them. So we're going to do let player x and let player y. And so here I'm not in I can I don't have to for a let initialize the value that is give it a default value here uh, so I don't have to have an equal sign and what will equal is undefined um, in this case because I'm gonna draw with it right away I want to give it a default value um, so in our case we're gonna use the values that we were basically putting this in so we're gonna if we've never put our mouse over the canvas we're gonna start our character is gonna be in the middle so player X is that player Y is that so it'll still default to the middle. And then I'm going to come down here, change my arc, and instead of using that canvas variable, I'm going to use my player variable. Then, so we should be able to see this, and it should still be in the middle. Yay. Now what we're going to do, anytime we get an event, we're going to change these variables now. So we're going to do um, player x equals event dot offset x, player y equals event dot offset y. Uh, so, now, if we put our mouse on here, it should not do anything. Cause, oh, sorry. Um, reason it didn't do anything is we need to set up our draw loop. Um, so what's happening right so far 
is our page loads up and it runs all this code and then it calls it done. And this guy's an event, so it'll go off. It'll run this little chunk of code every time something happens, but none of the other code reruns. So what we actually want to do in a game is we'll have a draw loop um, or a render loop or that's Google. I'm sure there's other words. Uh, game render loop. Let's see if we can find some official loops. Game loop. Uh, a whole bunch of others. I like to sep. I like to when I'm describing it. I separate it out into two parts. I call one part a tick, and one part the draw. And basically, what I do is for every frame, I tick, and in the tick, I do all of the logic. So like, uh, I check. Did I hit something? Do I need to delete that? Do I need to add a new thing? Do I need to move something? Whatever that may be. That all logic goes in the tick. And then after tick is done, I draw. So that means that I take all those updated values and I redraw my screen. Um, so let's go ahead. We'll make two functions. We're going to call them tick. And we're going to call the other draw. And so then the, oops, need an equal sign there. And so then our draw fun our drawing code is going to go in draw. So we're going to take this out of here and we're going to put it in here. And then our tick code is going to call draw. And then what we're also going to do, so if we so we're going to have a tick down here at the very end, which is going to kick off our tick. So that's going to call our first tick. And so it's going to call our first tick. Tick will call draw. Draw will draw our first one. But that's still not going. We still don't have a loop here. So what we're going to do is we're going to go into tick and we're going to put a set timeout. So set timeout is a function that basically after a certain amount of time it's going to call whatever function you gave it. So uh, so we're going to have it call tick. And then the, that certain amount of time, it's in milliseconds, so what we're going to do let's make a um, a variable we're going to call it SP FPS, which is frames per second. Um, probably everyone on Twitch is well aware what FPS is. And we're going to go for, so normally we'd probably go a little higher. Uh, because I'm streaming this, I don't want it to lag too bad, so I'm going to do 20. Um, if you download this code, feel free to crank it up to 60. It should still work and run a little smoother. Um, so, and then to translate an FPS to an amount of time to wait, so if we have 20 frames per second and we have we have to specify this in milliseconds. So there's a thousand milliseconds. One second equals a thousand milliseconds. And so if we have 20 FPS, we're just going to do 1000 divided by our FPS. Oops, and that's all caps. FPS. And in this here too, if you're you know a gamer and you're aware of fixed versus um, unlimited FPS. We're technically doing fixed FPS because we're saying we're going to try render 20. may not be a perfect 20 all the time and this gap may not be perfect in between every time but it's going to be pretty darn close unless we're doing something that's going to lag it. You can also implement an auto FPS you know as fast as possible basically um, which the code's a little bit different um, basically you just call tick as soon as you you call the next tick as soon as the first tick's done. Uh, but for now, for a simple game, we're just going to go fixed FPS. Um, so we'll do this. So now what's going to happen, so we're calling our first tick first. It's going to come here. It's going to call draw. It's going to draw our screen. Then it's going to call set timeout. And so after 1,000 divided by FPS, which is what? 1,000 divided by 20, that's 50. So after 50 milliseconds, it's going to call tick again. It's going to draw. Go here. Go here after 50 milliseconds, blah, blah, blah. So it's going to keep going around in a circle. So that's why we call it a loop, because it keeps going. You know, it's it's tick to draw. So it's tick, draw, back to tick, draw, back to tick. So we have a loop. So that's why it's called a game loop or a render loop, draw loop, whatever you may have, call it. Um, <coughs> so got that. And then what's also going to happen now, so this is what's called an asynchronous event. Asynchronous means uh, normally things happen synchronously, which means they happen one after another in a fixed order. So all of these commands are synchronous because this guy is going to run, then this guy, then this guy. They're all going to run in order. It's not going to suddenly do this guy before it does this guy. Asynchronous code 
can happen pretty much whenever. Um, <laughs> different languages handle different handle async code differently. Uh, for Java, the way I like to think about it is if you imagine kind of you have a conveyor belt going, like, you know, you might send packages or like your luggage on the airport, you have a conveyor belt and it's running things along. And you have all of your synchronous code kind of sitting here in regular intervals and stuff. And they're nice and evenly spaced out and it just kind of happens. Asynchronous code is like, oh, we got to sneak up, we got to get something in here as quick as possible. So it's going to find a gap and shove that asynchronous code in here. So you may have a little bit of synchronous, a little bit of async. Um, this isn't going to be like per line. It's going to be per chunk. So really, all of our starting stuff is a chunk. And then when we get to the point where we're waiting for our timeout to happen, that's our first gap. And that's where this stuff can happen. And then it would do all this again. And then we'd have another gap and um, etc. So that's kind of how I think about it. It's not the super technicalist description ever, but it's pretty accurate conceptually. It's a good way to think about it. So now if I refresh the page, we now have my little character following me. So it gets a little bit behind. That's mostly just because of the frame rate issue. If I come in here and crank up the frame rate, um, and I don't know how this will actually look on the stream, it's going to stay a little bit closer to me. Uh, if I crank it up like really high, they'll stay even closer. Um, still gets kind of far out because um, our mouse event, our mouse over event, will only ha trigger every so often as well. So that's why there's still a little bit of a gap, but it's a very minor gap. Um, so turn back down to 20. Uh, but you notice we are creating this kind of weird tail effect, which kind of looks cool, but that's not really what we want. Reason for this is when we draw to the canvas if you think about like an actual art canvas that you put paint on you know if you add some paint the other paint didn't disappear if you wanted to only show one circle here and then you wanted to show just one circle here you have to blank out the whole canvas with white paint so that's basically what we need to come in here and do so we're going to come here we're going to call context dot and there's a handy function for it called clear rec and then we just need to specify the x, y width and height of the rectangle we want to draw. So in this case, we want to clear out the whole canvas. So we're going to do 0 and 0. So we're going to start up here. And then we're going to do canvas width and canvas height. And that's going to fill in the whole thing. So canvas width, canvas height, semicolon. I don't actually think I mentioned semicolon. So in most programming languages, you put a semicolon at the end of the line to indicate it's the end of the line. Because technically, I can break this up into quite a few lines. So semicolon just lets it know it's the end of the command. Um, in JavaScript in particular, it's not super strictly required, but it is recommended. That's why I get a little um, yellow marker, is, which is like a warning. So it's like, hey, you probably want to put a semicolon there. OK. so. Go here. So yay! Now, so now, w what's happening? We we're, we're ticking. So we draw our circle, and then when we move, we clear everything. We draw our circle again. We draw our circle again. Draw our circle again. And I'm talking like it's one, two, three moves, but really it's like one of the whole bunch of ticks in there because if they're firing off every every 50 milliseconds, which I think, and you blink about two in takes about 200 milliseconds to blink so really we're drawing four times every time you blink if you're a fairly fast blinker um okay so we got that going now one last little tweak here our characters are circle where we're still seeing our mouse that's kind of distracting and ugly so why don't we go ahead and we're going to hide our mouse so to hide our mouse we're going to use some css again on our canvas and we're going to do a uh, pointer no sorry um no, it is pointer. Pointer. Uh, did I brain break one? Cursor. It is cursor. Okay, there we go. Cursor, none. So that will make it so anytime we are on top of our canvas, our mouse disappears. When I get off my canvas, my mouse comes back. So 
because that, that cursor none only affects my canvas. So it's only when I'm over my canvas. So there we go. So now it looks like I'm just moving my little guy with my mouse. So now what we want to do too is I don't really want my character to be able to go off the screen. So if I move my mouse over here, I think I want, even though I'm moving to the right, I don't want my character to keep moving to the right. So what I'm going to do for that is we're going to clamp the space that it can go. So clamp's real simple conceptually. Uh, basically, clamps are uh, used pretty commonly in different engines and stuff. So if you imagine a number line, I have like 0 here, and then it goes to 10, and it goes to negative 10 here, you know, and you have all the different numbers in between. Uh, say I want to clamp it between like 2 and 5. So if you imagine like I just have a clamp here. That's kind of where it gets its name from. So all we're going to do to clamp it is that basically means if I'm clamping between 2 and 5, that means the smallest number I'll possibly allow to come out of there is 2. Biggest number I'll possibly allow is 5. And let's go ahead and let's make a clamp function because then we don't have to keep repeating the code to do the clamp function. So we're going to call it clamp. And we're going to give it two numbers, our min number and our max number. <coughs> so then, to clamp it, so, oh, and then um, we'll do, let's say, actual min and max. Um, so actual is the number that we are trying to use, and then min is our minimum, maximum is our maximum we're allowed. So to do this, all we're going to do is we're going to return math.com min. So math.min will take any number of numbers as arguments and will return the smallest one out of those. So this is a little funny here, but we're going to return the minimum number we're going to return is between actual or max. And it feels like we're kind of mixing up min and max, but if you think about it, if my max is 10 and actual is 12, I want to return max, which is the smaller out of those two. And then um, to, so that'll clamp it on one end, and then to clamp it on the other end, we're going to do, uh, on actual, we're going to do math.max actual min. So, if we think about it with some numbers here, let's say actual equals 10, min equals 2, max equals 8. So, it'll, when you'll do this part first because it'll always, just like in math class, uh, you always kind of work inside to outside with parentheses. Same with code. So we're going to start with the inside here. So math.max, actual and min. So actual is 10, min is 2. So we're going to take the biggest number out of those two, which is actual. So now we basically have at 10 right here, and then we have 8 there. So now we're doing min with 10 and 8. So in this case, 8 is the smaller of the two, so we're going to return 8. So we successfully clamped it on that side. If we test it the other way, we'll do 0 here. So we have math.actual between, or math.max between 0 and 2. So the maximum, the biggest out of those two is 2. So then this part is essentially 2, so it's 2 versus 8, and we're getting min, so the minimum is 2. So it works on that side. And then let's put something in between. So here we got max is between 5 and 2. 5 is bigger. This part's 5, so we're doing min between 5 and 8. 5 is the smaller, so we'll get actual. So clamp function wor should work here. And then one nifty th syntax thing with arrow functions only, it doesn't work with the other type of function, but it works with arrow functions. If you want to return, so a return value means when I call clamp, it's going to return whatever this is. So just like math.max returns the maximum between these two, so it has a return call in there, our clamp's going to return the result of this little equation here. So um, with arrow functions, you can actually make it a little smaller looking. If you remove the bracket, the curly brackets, and then you re remove the word return, this is actually the same exact thing as if I had the curly brackets on the word return. It's just a little smaller, more concise. So usually if I have just a function that just is one return thing, I'm going to do this. It doesn't work if it's multi-line, so like if I had some other code here, I can't 
do that because then it gets all confused. So it only works if it's one line and it's returning, but that actually happens more than you might think in code. So it turns out to be pretty handy. Um, okay, so we have our clamp function. So now let's go down here. So player x, so this is what we want to clamp. So player x, so let's go think about this. So on this side to clamp it, remember our player x is actually referring to the middle of our circle. So if I wanted to clamp right here where it's touching the edge but it's not going over, I actually need x to be the same number as my radius right now. So that means my minimum is my radius. It's not zero. So we're going to clamp to, um, and that would be player size divided by two. So that's my minimum. And then over here on my maximum, if we think about it, so it's, if we think about in terms of variables we have access to, we know the center of my circle. We also know how wide our canvas is. So if we do canvas minus radius, that'll get me back to the center from this side. So I'm going to do canvas width minus player size divided by 2. Because that's, remember, player size divided by 2 is radius. And then I'm going to put my closing parentheses. So now we're clamping it on that side. And see how, it, see this line right here? This line is basically warning you, your program is starting to get long and it's going to be get harder to read. It, strictly speaking, doesn't hurt anything, but it's good to try to keep your code from not going over that line. So usually when a function starts getting long, what I'm going to, what I do is I'll switch it so every different parameter is on its own line. It doesn't affect how the code runs, it just affects how the code looks here. It makes it a little easier for me to read. Um, so we have that clamp there. And then for y, it's pretty much exactly the same. We're just going to swap out our x's for y. So up here, if you th think about it, our center of our circle is actually radius from the top. And we're really, we're adding, you know, the 0 plus radius, but 0 added to anything is, doesn't change anything, so we can just leave it off. And then down here is canvas height minus radius. So. I'm going to hit, in uh, IntelliJ, you can hit Control d to clone a line, duplicate a line. And so I just, I duplicated it, and I'm just going to change it to Y, and I'm going to change it to height. So now, if I run this guy, I should keep my circle always inside there. There we go. Cool. Always inside of there. Okay. Nifty. So now we got our player moving. Yay. Okay, so now we need things to hit. We need enemies. So let's start out. Let's go ahead and let's make... We'll start simple. Let's start with just one enemy. So let's go ahead and define... We'll define an enemy size. Let's say our enemy is 40 as well. And we're going to do a square for that guy. Okay, so let's go ahead. Let's make a let for our enemy enemy x and let's say for now we'll just hard code something let's say it starts up here and so it's going to be off the screen so if we want it off of there from the top then we're going to go negative because remember this line is zero so if I go negative that's going to push me up here and I want it to be just at the edge of the screen just off so with a rectangle our, our actually yeah with a rectangle by default um, our, where we're drawing from, instead of the center like we did a circle, it's actually going to be the top point. So, circle, or square, sorry, this is zero, zero. Circle, this is zero, zero. And you can do a little math to tweak it, and in fact we will, because it really helps if we're consistent between the two shapes. But for now, we'll just start with, we'll just keep zero, zero for now. So, enemy x, so, if it is zero zero, it's going to open up a new one. If so, if we have our canvas here, and we have, and our enemies right here, then its y position is zero minus enemy y because this is zero zero here, or enemy height rather. Sorry. So we're going to subtract that from it to get our y. 
to put it just off the screen. So uh, zero, we don't have to explicitly specify, so we're just going to do minus enemy size. And then, oh, sorry, that's actually our Y. For our X, let's just pick somewhere random in between there, in between our two edges. So if we want random, there is a handy function called math.random. And it'll generate a random number. Technically, all numbers on computers are pseudo-random um, because computers can't actually generate truly random numbers. The distinction doesn't really matter for game design. If you're doing soup like encryption, banking stuff, then it starts to matter. We're not going to worry about all that, uh, at least not today. So the math.random works a little different in different languages. In JavaScript, it uh, gives you a number between zero, gives you a decimal number between zero and one. So if I run it a bunch of times, you can see it gives me different numbers every time. If I want to um, make it between two numbers, I just multiply the number first. So math.random times, say I want uh, it to have a maximum of 100, I'm going to do times 100. So all these numbers will be somewhere between 0, but never quite 100. And then say I want the smallest possible number to be, um, <coughs> excuse me, uh, say 10. So I want a number between 10 and 0. What I have to do, I add 10 to it, but then I have to subtract that 10 from my 100. So this will always give me a number between 10 and 100 how this is written right here, it won't ever actually give me 100. Well, it will... Hey, JD, we're just in the middle of our thing. Thanks for checking it out. Um, so, if I want an even number, all I have to do is I can use either math.seal, which is short it, for sealing, which will... Um, raise any decimal number up to the next number. So if I do like, when I have to do like one point blah, 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 one, uh, too many. We hit the uh, extent of floating point precision there. Uh, there we go. Some just teensy bit above one will go two. If I do floor, no matter what the decimal is, it's going to take it down to the next one. There's also a math.round, which will do um, the rules that you learned in math class, which is if it's one point if it's 0.5 or more, it goes up. If it's less than 0.5, it goes down. Almost never actually use that in um, this kind of stuff. So, uh, so we're going to make use of either floor or seal. Uh, so let's go. And so, if we want a random spot in between the two spots, we'll have zero. So we're going to be between zero and 800. So between the edge and our canvas. But just like our circle. We don't want it to be half hanging over each. So our real bounds, so if we think about it here, um, so if we were at this edge, our enemy's x would be 0. If we are at this edge, though, our, our point's right here, so we'd really be canvas width minus the width of our enemy. So that's where we're going to clamp our value between. Just like we clamped this guy, we're going to use our clamp up here too for our random. So let's start with the clamp. So we won't worry about what number we're generating yet. I'll come in just a sec. But let's go ahead. We'll define so our minimum is 0. And our maximum is what we just said, which is canvas width minus enemy size. Enemy size. There we go. Okay. So now for this guy, so we're obviously we're going to do math.random. And we want it between 0 and canvas.width or canvas this value. And so um, if you just remembered what I said, we have a random value times our max. Eh, let me go type it out. Ba -ba 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 text. It is uh, r equals uh, way too tiny. And a terrible font for this stuff. Let's go to something boring, Arial. Boring is readable. Okay, so our random times our max minus our min plus min. So in this case, our minimum is zero. 
So we can, if, we, if you do a little bit of algebra, we plug those in, those zeros don't affect anything. So really our math just turns nice and simple. It's our r times our max. And um, so if we do random times, and we'll use this guy here. And then so that's going to give us a number between 0 and not quite this number. So if I want it truly to be able to do both 0 and this exact number, I have to do math.seal. No, math.floor plus 1. Because if I floor it, so if I get a random number between, say, math.random um, times 100, the biggest number I can get isn't actually 100. It's like 99 point a whole bunch of nines. Uh, so we'd get something that was between 0 and that. So I'm going to floor it, which means I'm going to chop off the decimal point. So if like that would mean like if my zero was that. Now I have a number between zero and nine nine, and then I add. Wait, sorry. Dot floor seal. Mm, doing something. Hang on. <laughs> Let's see. Not that floor. So if I had a number, if I had one, that would actually put me at one to one hundred. Um, but I want zero to be able to hit zero as well. So I want to do. What do I want to do? I should not know this. <laughs> uh, seal. Oh, duh. We have to actually add one to this guy, and then we floor it. No. Yes. Yes. Yeah, that's right. We add one to that guy, because uh, that would give us. So adding one to it, we'd basically be doing like math.random times 101. That would give us a number between. 0 and 100.99999. Flooring it would give us a number between. Uh, that's still not right. Uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. Let's see, math.floor. Sorry, this should be simple, but it's been a while since I've done this. Um, it would give us a number between 0 and 100 if we floored it. Yeah, there we go. And we don't add the 1, we don't add the outside 1. That's what I was doing wrong. There we go. One goes inside the floor. So this will give us a true number between 0 and canvas width minus enemy size. And here we have, we're doubling up on this logic, which it's usually better if you're doing something like that to do, um, to put that into a variable. So we'll call it enemy max, uh, max x, because that's really what it is. And that would be that guy. And then we can use enemy max x here. And then we can use enemy max x here. That way, if we realize, oh, I did totally mess up and I need plus 10 or whatever, we change it in one place and it changes it everywhere. Yay, variables. Um, OK, so now we have our enemy max, or our enemy x and y, where we're going to start them out. And for now, just temporarily, because we're going to plus 100 on there, that's just to shove it down so we can make sure we actually drew it right. Because um, if not, we'll not know if it's actually there, because it'll be off screen. So we'll come down here to our draw function. So we had our one path for this guy, and we so all of this was drawing our one character. And actually, um, so for our next guy, we're gonna set the fill style. Let's make our enemy. Let's go some shade of red since we're doing that here. Why not this shade? Same shade we're drawing with here. So we're gonna do that. I like uppercase. Doesn't matter which one you like. Just stick with it. And then stroke style. We'll go three 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 again. We don't have to have a stroke, but uh, for now we will. And then for a rectangle, it's actually a lot easier than drawing a circle. We don't have to deal with the whole path thing. There's actually just functions context.fillrec, and then it's the x and y to start at. So in this case, enemy x and y. And then the width and height, and that's the same for our enemy, both width directions right now. And then so that'll fill the rec, and then one more duplicates line, do stroke rec, and that will give it a stroke. So just like we had to fill it and stroke it here, we'll do the same here. Uh, but we don't have to deal with the path stuff. Ooh, and something blew up. Okay, so here we have clamp is not a function. So clamp is a function. We may clamp. Problem, though, is clamp is down here, 
and I'm trying to use it up here. So remember, this code starts at the top and goes down. So I haven't actually made clamp yet. So uh, at that point in time. So what we need to do, let's just for now, we'll drag clamp up above that line. So we'll just put clamp somewhere up here for now. So as long as we're above there, we're all happy. Refresh. There we go. Okay. So we got our character. He's there. He's normally would be up here, but because we shoved him on screen, just so we can make sure he exists, uh, he's there. If you notice, I'm actually behind him right now. That's not. I actually would prefer to be on top of him. The reason I'm behind him, is because I drew the player first, and then I drew the enemy, and things stack on top. So again, think like a canvas that you would use paint on. I'm going. I drew my circle, and then I drew my rectangle on top of that, so the rectangle's on top. So let's just grab our enemy's code and plop it above our player's code, but below clear rec, because we want to do that first, because if we put it above, we'd clear it as soon as we draw. So there. And notice it's hopping around because we have that random bit in there. So it's going to randomly start in some position. So that'll be cool. That way it won't be the same thing every single time. Okay. So now that we know he's up there, let's go ahead and get rid of that random plus 100 I put there. So he'll actually get off the screen. So now what we're going to do, so for our enemy, we want him to move down. So what we're going to do is in our tick function, so if you remember I said draw is where we do the actual drawing, but tick is where we do the logical stuff. In our tick function, we're going to do enemy y, and we're going to increase this. So you actually have a couple ways to do math in when it comes to variables. Uh, you can do variable equals variable and then plus 10. Uh, our signs are plus, minus, just like you do in math. Divide is a slash. Multiplication is an asterisk. And then we have another one called mod, uh, modulus operator, which we won't worry about just yet, but it's our percent sign. So we can do um, enemy y plus 10. And remember, we want to do plus because this is 0 and this is 800. So if we want to move down, we're going to increase our y, and that's going to move us down. So we could do it like this. This will work. And in fact, if we come over here, this might be too fast. Eh, that's not too bad. Kind of, kind of jittery, but that's okay for now. We'll, there's a, we'll get rid of the jitteriness in a bit. So that's one way to do it. Um, another way is if you're adding some number or some value can be a variable, another variable too, to the variable, and then setting it to that same variable. You can actually do a shorthand, which is plus equal or minus equal or uh, whatever. And this is functionally exactly the same. And in fact, this would be the preferred way to do it. And you have it. And so we can see it goes. So now our enemy is moving down the screen. Cool. Um, so now we have an enemy. He can move. Um, now let's take a step back and look at our code for a second. So now we're, we're at, what, 62 lines of code. We're starting to have quite a bit going on here. So we have our character code and our enemy code and our tick and setting up our enemy and our canvas and all kinds of stuff going on here. Um, we may not, it, it's starting to get a little trickier to read, uh, really. Um, so what we're going to do, let's take a step back and we're going to do what's called refactor our code. So refactoring is any time you go and you change around your code and you're not changing what your code is doing, you're just changing kind of how your code is laid out. Um, so well, we're, let's go and so functions, you know, we talked about their ways to create handy code. Uh, they're also handy ways to group related code together. So let's say, so this code, chunk of code right here draws our enemy. So why don't we go and let's make a function called draw enemy. And then let's move that code into here. And then where we took that code out, we'll just call that function instead. So this will do exactly the same thing it was doing a second ago. It's just a little easier to read. And then let's keep going with this. Const draw uh, player. And then we'll take our player code and we'll put it in there. And then we can just call draw player. And there we go. Now our draw function is way easier to tell what's going on. We know that our draw function clearing the rack is drawing the enemy and it's drawing the player. And now 
I may not know exactly how it's drawing the enemy just by looking here, and I may not know exactly how it's drawing the player just by looking here, but that's okay. In programming, we call that abstraction, and abstraction is your friend. Um, you know, the projects I work on in a day-to-day -day basis, I think they, uh, not think, I know some of them probably have over 100,000 lines of code. If I was to try to keep track of every little bit and bob of every little piece of that going on, my head would explode. That's just way too much to keep track of. So what abstraction does is it lets us create, um, you know, chunks like these functions, and it's like, okay, I want to draw the player. At this moment, I don't care how the player is drawn. I just want you to draw it. So as long as it draws it, I don't care how the player is getting drawn right now. Um, and so we can keep adding levels of le layers of abstraction, and that'll help our code be much more readable, much more uh, memorable, much easier to understand. Um, so abstraction is your friend. Okay, and then let's go up here. And so now, so that's one, so creating different functions is one way to uh, abstract a code. But now we still have, so we have, like, we're setting up our player, or we're drawing our player here, but then we have a bunch of code up here to, um, to render, to set up our player and stuff, and we have these constants that are also about our player. So all the stuff about our player is kind of spread out in a couple different places. So what we can also do is we can create what's called a class or an object. Uh, so a class, or sorry, let's do an object first. An object is basically a grouping of different values together, essentially. Um, so in JavaScript, I can create an, a, uh, an object by wrapping curly brackets and then giving it a number of properties or keys. Um, so in here we're giving it the property ABC and I can set that to some variable like object and then just like we've been doing those dots this whole time I can do object dot A and look at that I get A out or if I do object dot B I get B out um, the document we've been using that's actually an object and if I spit that out uh, actually documents a bad example document shows up here a little funny uh, let's do um, math for example Math is another object we've been using. So math has all of these functions as properties and all of these constants. So math is an object. Document's an object. Um, canvas is an object. Uh, context is an object. All of these things are objects, basically. In some language, in not all languages is this true, but in JavaScript, even functions are objects. That's not true in every language, but quite a few of them it probably is. Um, but yeah, so basically everything's an object. Or uh, the opposite, the not opposite, but the other thing that's not an object is called a primitive. Uh, so like basic numbers are primitives. Um, booleans, which we haven't used yet, but booleans are true and false values, so it's either true or it's false. Those are primitives. Um, some languages, there's a distinction between primitives and objects. JavaScript's a little weird because literally everything's an object. So even primitives are objects in uh, JavaScript. So like if I do 20 dot, um, uh, hang on, let's put in a variable. So it'll give me some autocomplete. A dot, yeah, like I can do 20 dot two fixed, uh, five. There. Wait, what? Oh, right. Uh, yeah. So even numbers are objects in JavaScript, and they have functions and stuff attached to them. Um, and then we have, so I can't create a, an object just directly, just like I did up here. I'm just like, okay, I want an object, and I want to have ABC, and it has these values. And you can also change those, so like I can set object A to 5, and then you can see 5 there. And I can also add them on the fly in JavaScript. Can't do that in every language, but JavaScript you can. JavaScript basically lets you do whatever the heck you want, which is both good and bad. It's good because it let allows for some very nice um, things, but it's bad because if you go a little crazy, you can get yourself in trouble. But uh, JavaScript pretty much lets you do whatever you want. So um, we can also now, and this is kind of newish to JavaScript. It's been around for a couple of years now. We can also create what's called classes. Um, classes have been around in other languages forever. Um, Class is part of the object-oriented programming paradigm. Um, so Java and C-sharp are object-oriented programming languages. Uh, so they have classes in them. 
Um, JavaScript is technically a prototypal language, which is kind of similar to, to object-oriented, but slightly different in some very technical nitpicky ways, which we don't have to worry about right now, luckily. So mention it just in case anyone asks you, is JavaScript object-oriented? You can be like, yes, but it's technically, you know, it's objects are prototypal. Um, and they'll be really impressed. Um, so, but what a class basically is, is a blueprint for creating an object. So here I created this object with A, B, C. If I wanted to make a new object with that, I'd have to copy all those properties over again. I'd have to uh, type them out again. What I can also do is I can create a class, and a class is a blueprint of an object. And it, it has a constructor. The constructor is called, when you go to create one of these, uh, when you go to create an object out of this blueprint, out of this class, it, you, when it's uh, called instantiation. So when you go to instantiate an instance of a class, very technical lingo, don't actually need to know that unless you're going to take a computer science quiz. Um, so in here I can do like A1, oops, now I have to refresh the page. Um, is that A, this dot C equals 3. So now I have my blueprint, and my blueprint is basically I have my constructor, and it's going to set the instance of A, which is what refers to this, so this is the copy of A that I've made, the instance of A I've made. So the the instance is A is going to be 1, the instance is B is going to be 2, the instance is C is going to be 3. So then to create an instance of an object, I do new A, and so we'll put that in A. And we can see here, it looks pretty darn similar to that object that I made by hand. Uh, it has a little bit of other stuff going on behind the scenes, because you can notice, like, um, see how Chrome is showing that it's an instance of A? And technically has what's called a prototype. Uh, this is where that whole prototypal thing comes in. Uh, we're not going to worry about the prototype right now. Uh, we're just going to worry about what classes are for now. Um, but it's a blueprint. And then if I want another new A, I just call new A, and I can make another new A, and I can make I can make A's all day. Um, and they're all different A's. So like if I change B's dot A, it didn't change A or C, it just changed B. So that's where the whole this comes in. So when it set this one's A. So they're all independent ones, but they're all individual things. And so this isn't super duper helpful right here all by itself, but if you imagine, you can also to classes, in addition to adding properties or member uh, member values or member data, depending which language you're working on. Uh, JavaScript, I think properties is the technical term. You can also add functions. Um, so a function is like, uh, let's see, what you got. I'm gonna, and I can add this function here. And this function works pretty much just like the other functions we had. The difference being this function has access to when I, if I refer to this, I'll get the stuff specific to this guy. So like uh, this guy output this dot A, this dot B, this dot C. Log. Okay, so now I make a new A. And I'll put it, and I open it up here. Oop, wait. Eh, hang on. I, yeah, it's there. Yeah. Doesn't out, doesn't show it here, but it's actually in our prototype here. So now I can do a dot what you got, and that's going to run this with this thing. And so now, if you imagine, we start adding more and more. Now we have a blueprint that's actually complex and does stuff, and we can group all our things together. So reason I start talking about this is let's cr use classes to get the the disparate bits of player all put together in one place so let's make a class called player and so player has some properties its properties are these two things so let's pull them in here and so when I want to put actually let me check my Yeah, actually, I think Babel will let me do that. Yes. Okay. So, um, over in Chrome, I, I initialize these values in here. 
The reason I did that is because Chrome, last time I checked, unless they've changed it. Oh, hang on, sorry. Yeah, doesn't matter right now. Uh, class player a equals five. I don't think Chrome allows this yet. Oh, actually, Chrome does now. Chrome used to not allow this as of a little while ago. Cool. So it does allow member properties. So we can set them these here, and those will become member properties. So that this this syntax is identical in purpose to this syntax. Um, this is kind of the older school way, um, and this is the new way. So this is the way we want to do it. Um, cool. So we'll set our x and our y, and then, so that gets those in there, and then let's go set, uh, or let's not set, let's pull our draw function into there. So we're going to pull it in there. Oh, and if you noticed, I got rid of the lets. Um, member properties are always let by, like, um, uh, what's the word? Uh, inferred to be let. That means they're assumed to be let. Um, you can't actually have a const in here, really. There's some tricky ways you can kind of fake it, but you can't really have a let. But normally you don't have to worry about that. So we're going to have, so basically I just take off the lets, but these still work like lets, so they're still changeable. Then I'm going to put our draw player in here. And again, uh, pretty much the only change I have to do here is chop this off. And let's make sure that guy's, yeah, that guy's works. Too. So I have draw player. So now we pulled our draw bit. We pulled our, um, our um, initialization bit. And let's pull our constant in there, too. So <laughs> constant, there's two ways to do this. One way is to just treat it like a member value like this. Um, that's OK, not great. Uh, really what we want, though, is we want a static. So if you look at um, like my, um, when I did math, oh, sorry, let me see. Do you have a lisp? Uh, I, yes, I definitely do have a lisp. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, OK, so if you remember when I did um, math back here, math dot and anything like min. So I didn't call new math because this min is actually a static method. That means instead of living on new math dot min, it actually lives directly on math dot min. So if I'm for this value, this value is the same for all players, no matter how many copies I make, for now. If we want to change that later, we can. But for now, it's static. So I'm going to do this. So instead of then doing, um, getting it off a new player, we'll get it directly off player itself. Um, and then, um, yeah, so we pull the player size in. So here we go. We're pretty good here now. Now one thing I want to do, so we have player size, player x, player y, draw player. But we're in the player class. We know everything in here relates to player. So what we can do is we can get rid of um, the player because we already know this refers to it. We already know this is the x of player, so we don't have to repeat the word player over and over again. We've not actually come across a super duper uh, official term for it, but where I work, uh, we actually call it stutter. So we avoid stuttering. We avoid repeating words that we don't need to. And then we just have to, when we did that, we have to come in here and we're going to, um, we have to change these. So now, instead of player.x is going to be this.x, uh, player.y is this.y, um, and that's good there. And then size, so this is where I mentioned it's not this.size, it's player.size here, because that's a static. Um, and static also, so if I create like 10 players, we're going to have 10 copies of X and Y. But if I create 10 players, we still only actually have one copy of size. Um, so that's another thing about static. They're part of the class. They're, they're part of the blueprint. They're not part of what the blueprint creates. Uh, Player.size. OK, so there's our player. So now to use it, we're going to create an instance of the player. So let's come up here. And we can actually make this player instance const because we're not actually going to change the player itself. Um, so we'll do const player equals new player. And then down here in our event, so our event is changing the player, but it's really a part of Canvas. 
So we're not going to pull this into the player. We're going to keep that on the canvas. But we can come in here and we can do player.x and player.y. And then in here, instead of this draw player, we're going to do player.draw. Now, if I haven't goofed anything else up while we were doing that, then we goof something up. Oh, wait. Is that what I think I did? Oh, yes. Uh, yeah, just like before with clamp, uh, we have player down too far. So I'm going to pull player up to the top for a second. We're actually going to move it out of there, too. But just so we can see. All right, so cool. So our player's back. So we're refactoring. We didn't really change what our program did, but we changed how it does it and how it's organized. So that's refactoring. So real quick, let's do our enemy the same way. So enemy, static, size. And this is going to also make it much easier because obviously we don't want one enemy in the entire game. That'd be a pretty boring game because this enemy is not exactly difficult to beat. We just have to touch it with the mouse. So, um, but once it's in here, we'll be able to create as many enemies as we want. Super duper easy. We'll just call new enemy and boom, we have a fully set up new enemy, um, for us. So, uh, X and Y, we can pull those out and max we can, um, <laughs> yeah, we'll just put that in there too. Enemy max, max, okay. And then let's not change that just yet. Let's pull the draw function in there. Okay, and we'll do draw. And do, 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 and then we'll go. Oh, right, the constants. That's the other one. Pull this guy into it. Oh, which I already did. Okay, so we'll just delete that one. Okay, cool. And then just like we did with player, let's come here and instead of enemy x, it's this dot x. Instead of um, enemy y, it's this dot y. This dot y. And then it's a static, so enemy dot size like this. Enemy dot size. Whoops. Enemy dot size and enemy dot size. Okay, cool. So now we got our enemy. So just like with our player, let's go make a const enemy equals new enemy to initialize a new enemy. Then we're going to do and change this up a bit to be that. And then this will be enemy dot draw. Okay, and I th think that was all of them for that. Nope, I missed something. So enemy size is not defined. Click the line. All right, right there. So uh, line 31, right there is where I missed it. So enemy dot size. Okay. Refresh. Whoops, still got something wrong. Enemy max m is not defined. Line 32. Ah, didn't swap that out. So this would be this dot max x and this dot max x. Oops this dot max x cool very good thank you said who thank you Th thorium um uh thorium asked have you studied anything code related in higher education yeah so i actually have a, a bachelor's degree in computer science and i've been um coding uh professionally for almost 10 years now um yeah my day-to-day -day job i'm a, a senior engineer and a tech lead for my team Yep, and thank you, set who. All right, so line 33 we got, and then let's see, we'll go refresh again. Cool, so we're back to normal. So, refractor successful. We changed everything around. Okay, so now, now we've got our code nice and grouped up. So that's a makes it much easier to read. But we're still kind of getting big. We still have you know 78 lines of code. Not not huge, but it's getting a little tricky to read. So what we're going to do now is let's actually pull enemy and player into their own files. So we'll go make a new file. So in IntelliJ, I have the folder I want, right click, new file, and then type the name. So for classes, the convention is usually um, the exact class name, including capital letters. Um, so we'll do enemy. We'll go ahead and make a new player. Okay. And then let's go here. Let's snag our player. Put him in there. Whoop, there we go. 
Let's say just copy paste. And I don't, oh, <laughs> somehow I must have lagged for a second or something. That was weird. Okay, and then grab that and paste that. Okay, so now we got any new files. So now we have a slight issue in that. Um, and IntelliJ is lagging a little behind. If we go refresh our page, it's going to yell at us. It doesn't know what player is. Um, good player is now in a different file. So we have to tell it about it. So what we're going to do is we're going to import player um, from player. So the syntax is import the thing we're importing from the file. And if you're not familiar with file system stuff, dot basically just means the same folder that I'm currently in. So the same folder as index.js is where we're going to go look for it. And then we have to also go over to player and we have to make sure we export player. So we can export by just putting export in front. So we can export uh, classes and we can also export variables, uh, con um, constants. Um, if we just do export like this, that's a named constant. And if we do that, we have to refer to it like this with curly brackets. And we're saying, go get the thing exactly named player inside of here based on that name. If we do a default constant, which you usually do for the main thing in your file, so for a class file, it's pretty much the class. If you do export default, you don't need these curly brackets, and it doesn't have to be the same exact name. You usually do use the same exact name, but technically this name can be Cookie Monster, and it would still work. I would just have to call it Cookie Monster in this file. Um, so do the export default there. Thank you, Thorium. <laughs> Okay, so now let's go do the same thing with enemy. So default export and enemy from enemy. And there we go. So now if we flip back, and we got a little bit of problem. The requested blah, blah, blah does not have an, oops, did I not type that right? Oh, I did typo something. Oh, I did default export. It's actually export default. There we go. And canvas whip. Ah, yes. Hang on, let me get my tool. Uh, hi, Carlo. Um, so now it's complaining that, so we're referring to canvas width over here, and it doesn't know what canvas width is. So just like when we pulled enemy out of this file, and this file forgot about enemy, we pulled enemy out, so it forgot about canvas width. So what we can, usually we'll, we can do with our con things like this, which we want to share a bunch, let's make a file called constants. I'm going to do lowercase uh, c on this guy. And we're going to move all of these constants here into a common spot that everyone's able to read. And then, just like with enemy and player, we have to export them. In this case, we don't really have a main thing for this file. They're all kind of equal weight. So we're not going to do any default export. We're going to export all of them individually. Uh, What's the name? Uh, Lone Double Agent asked, what's the name of the program I'm using? I'm using WebStorm, uh, which is by JetBrains. Uh, I had it open. I closed it. Um, you can really use anything. I like the JetBrains stuff. Uh, I also mentioned at the beginning of the stream, uh, Visual Studio. Uh, WebStorm has a free 30-day trial, and students can get it for free and stuff. If you don't qualify for that and you don't want to shell out money, uh, Visual Studio Code is another excellent option. Um, and yeah, said who said it is slower on older computers. It definitely can be. Um, pretty much every computer I use it on has at least 16 gigs of RAM, if not more, because uh, it definitely can bog it down. Uh, Visual Studio Code, so here, let's see. WebStorm is a good one from JetBrains. Um, it does cost money, 30-day trial, um, and they do have special offers, so you, you might clear that you might qualify for one of these and if you do you can get it free or cheaper uh, if you don't want to shell out money visual studio or visual yeah visual studio code um by microsoft is a pretty lightweight one it's pretty cool uh it's gotten really popular lately and yeah and it's completely free this one's 100 percent free um beyond that there's also uh you know tons of them uh limewire you could just get like notepad plus plus text pad a whole bunch of them um, you can use pretty much anything. Uh, but yeah, I definitely, these two are definitely my top two picks, uh, WebStorm and Visual Studio Code. So, um, cool. Oh yeah, and Adam. Carlo mentioned Adam. Adam is quite popular with some people. Um, okay, cool. So back to the code. 
Uh, so constants we're exporting, we're not default exporting because we don't have a main thing in this file. They're all kind of even, so we're going to export them. Then what we'll do is the files that need them, we're going to have to import. And IntelliJ, or sorry, WebStorm, um, is um, uh, pretty handy in that if you're missing an import, it'll give you a little squiggly line. If you mouse over, it'll say missing import statement. If you put your cursor on it, you can alt enter, and then it'll say insert blah, blah, blah from blah, blah, blah. Just hit that, and it'll give us our import for us. And I like spaces here. You don't have to, but that's the coding style I usually use. And then, um, yeah, so we'll do that. We also have issues with context here, but context is a little different. So let's we'll circle back to that. Let's go do player for our constants real quick first. OK, so we got that bit. And let's import this guy. And when you want to import multiple uh, not defaults, you just put a comma, and you can have them on one line like that. Uh, Vmax or Emacs, or sorry, Vim or, or Emacs, if you want to thoroughly customize, is also true. Uh, the people that use Vim kind of scare me. Uh, yeah, Vim is kind of tricky. Uh, Thor even says, don't recommend for absolute beginners, though. Yeah, Vim ha definitely has a learning curve. Uh, usually, the only time I use that is when I'm SSHing into servers. Um, okay, cool. So now we got this gun. So now. We're complaining, it, or actually, let's do this guy first. So here we're complaining we don't know what clamp is. So uh, why don't we, let's just like we pulled our constants out, clamp is kind of a utility function. Um, why don't we go ahead and let's make a our own math.js file, because clamp's kind of math related. Uh, in most game engines, clamp is, rela is somewhere related to the rest of their math code. And we'll do just like we did with, um, with our constants, clamp isn't really the main thing of our math file because we'll eventually probably have more math formulas here. Uh, so we'll just do regular export and then we can just come in here and we'll just import clamp. And I need to change my settings there. Okay, so now we got clamp. So now we have context here. And context is a little different than clamp and our constants were. So our constants and our clamp function, those never really change. Context can be different. Oh, and let's pull in our constants in this guy too. Okay, and since you can't see my keyboard, I was hitting Alt Enter on each one of those, and that was causing and Alt I was or I was hitting yeah Alt Enter and then Enter, and that was what was causing IntelliJ to pull these guys in for me automatically. Okay, so context though it's a little different. Context isn't a constant that we can just kind of stick in a file. So what we're going to do is instead of importing it, we're going to pass it in when we call the draw functions here. So we're going to do context and context here. So now we'll pass them in. So if we go to player, we're going to expect context to come in here. And so then we'll have that context to be able to do the rest of the things. Oh, and we need to import clamp right there too. Thank you, said who. Um, OK, so we got our clamp. Are we? So player looks sorted. I don't see any more squiggly lines. and. If you have an issue going on too in IntelliJ, or sorry, WebStorm, again, if I say IntelliJ, that's another JetBrains product that's very, very similar to WebStorm. It's just for Java instead of um, uh, HTML and JavaScript and CSS. Uh, IntelliJ means WebStorm. Uh, so they're pretty much the same thing. Uh, so in WebStorm, if you have an error, if you look on the side and you see colored bars, that's where it's indicating that you have bad lines. A lot of editors will actually do this too. Uh, they'll have these colored bars over here. So if you have like a long file that you can't see the whole file in one shot, you can look over here for color lines. We got no color lines over here, so that means we're probably good with our imports go here now. So still got a squiggly here, and we can see colored lines over here, and that's because we need to pop context in here. So I'll do that. So now those two should be sorted. And then let's pop over to our index and let's see if it's still sorted. It looks sorted as well. Uh, yeah, I, Thorium, I am uh, subscribing to the whole thing. I maintain a uh, uh, subscription to the master collection. I tend to hop languages a lot, so I kind of need them all. Yeah, yeah, JetBrains, ever since I started using JetBrains, it's been my favorite. Um, okay, cool. So. No more squiggly, so let's see. Are we working? And hey, look at that. We're back to normal. That was a lot of work to do not really anything, but now our code's a whole lot easier. 
Carlos, Carlos asked what's JetBrains. JetBrains is the uh, creator of WebStorm. Um, and JetBrains has a whole bunch of programs that are all almost the same program. Uh, the difference is different languages. They focus on different languages. Uh, so WebStorm is for like the web stuff. Ruby's for Ruby. Writers C Sharp. PyCharm is Python. PHP, Java, Go, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and so on and so forth. So um, yeah, uh, in our context, kind of JetBrains and WebStorm and IntelliJ and IDE and all those are pretty much synonyms. Uh, they all refer to the JetBrains IDEs. Um, Okay, so code's looking nice and organized now. So yeah, so now our, our main code is back down to just this little bit. So now we can tell pretty easily what's going on. We got a player and enemy, setting up our canvas, adding our mouse event. We got our nice little small tick, our small little draw, and then our tick here that kicks everything off. So now let's go ahead for this enemy. So if you... Reminder what our game is ultimately going to do is we have, well, that's gotten all messy. New window, new image. Um, so we're going to have our screen here. We're going to have our player in the middle. We're going to have enemies coming in from all sides like this. And we're going to have to hit our enemy with our circle. So let's go ahead, before we implement more enemies, let's go ahead and implement hitting our our enemy and making it do something. So right now, we have our two things moving around, but they're not really interacting. Like, hitting it doesn't do anything. Um, so, what we'll do now is we need to implement some code to determine if the two of them hit. So, first up, let's go tweak our player and our enemy a little bit, because to determine when two things hit, you actually you have two main techniques you can use to determine when things hit. The first technique, which we're going to implement because it's simpler for now, is hitbox detection. So if you imagine you have your characters, so in our case our character, well, let's use, let's pretend we had little, like, people looking characters. For hitbox detection, what you would do is you would have a box that, or a perfect rectangle around them, uh, not like actually drawn, but like a virtual kind of conceptually rectangle around them that you would keep track of. And then to determine if they hit, determine if they touch, you basically just do a little bit of math to determine are those rectangles overlapping. If they're overlapping, you're hit. You hit, and you can actually, in games that it matters, you can tell the amount of overlap would be how much they hit by. So that's the one we're going to implement. The other one is more uh, pixel perfect um, collision, and that one is a little bit. Uh, there's a couple different ways to do it. Um, the way that's generally most common in um, simpler things like JavaScript, like this, like our game right here, would be uh, you can actually have so we're drawing to this canvas here. You can actually have another canvas that people can't see that you can draw to um, that you can do various things on. And one of the things you can do is you can, I need my uh, brush back. Uh, one of the things you can do is if you draw two things in a certain mode, they'll actually change colors when they overlap. So like uh, kind of conceptually, you could imagine if like I had one character that was red and one character that was blue, you know, it might turn purple here. And so you can detect for those pixel, those different color pixels and see if they hit. And really what you would do, you wouldn't use the real colors. What you would do is you would turn them both into a certain color. And when they overlap, those that changes what that is. Um, that's one way to do pixel perfect. It's much more complicated than the hitbox logic we're going to do. We'll probably implement that in a future game or maybe even this game at some point. Uh, but for now, to keep it simple, we'll just implement hitbox. So hitbox, how we're going to do that is we're going to first let's go tweak our player and enemy a bit. So right now we're just keeping track of their X and Y. And then we're drawing them with our width and height, but we're not really saving their width and height. Let's go ahead and make width and height uh, be um, properties of them. Height equals enemy.size. And then we'll use this dot width and this dot height down here. This dot width, this dot height. OK. 
program. And then I'm going to go do the same on uh, player. And da, 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 so width equals size, height equals size, or player dot size, player dot size, player dot size, and then this is minus this dot width or this dot height. No, yeah, this dot width. Yeah, come back. And this guy is this dot width. Mm. Oh, actually, uh, no. Width, height, this guy is still divided by 2, because our circle is doing radius. Okay, divide by 2, and that should be height, because that's the y one. This dot height. Okay, so the reason I wanted to switch and have these come from these properties here is um, because in code, an easy we can easily represent a rectangle by if we have an x and y, and then we have a width and we have a height, then we know the bounds of the rectangle. So for our player character, its rectangle is x and y, width and height, or it will be in a second. There's a gotcha with our player right now, and then our enemy is the same. So now for our player, we need to tweak something for a bit. So if you remember earlier, our player currently, if we so here's our player. Our player's x and y is actually right here, and we're actually drawing the player around that x and y. For our enemy, the x and y is on the edge here. So for enemy, we have our rectangle already. We have x, y, width, and height. That gives us its rectangle. That doesn't quite work on player yet, so let's tweak how we draw a player a tiny bit. So let's make it so for player, instead of um, being centered, we're going to make the x be this point up here. And then we're going to draw it like that. Um, so to do that, so first up right now, the reason we did that was because when we move our mouse, we're setting the x and y to be those values. So let's stop setting these directly Let's instead give player a um, a method we can do. So let's call it update position x y, and then here instead of this guy updating its x and y directly, we're going to have it call player dot update position. Reason we're going to do that is because we're going to do a little math with those values we got in, so we can maintain our player's rectangle correctly because that's going to make a lot of things much easier down the line. Okay, so update our player uh, x and y. So now we'll go, let's go back to player. So now, <coughs> this x and y we want to be the center, but this x and y we want to refer to the outside. So what we'll do is we'll do this dot x equals x minus uh, width divided by 2 this dot width divided by 2, and then this dot y equals y minus this dot height divided by 2. So uh, if you think about it, so we have our circle, we have our center here, and then if we want to move the center to here, then we just divide it by half of its width and half of its height, and we get it up there. So that's what we're doing here. We're taking that center point, and we're doing minus this dot width divided by 2, so minus half of its width, and then y minus half of its height. And if we wanted to make this a little clearer, we should probably name these center x and center y. That way, when we look at this six months from now, we remember, oh yeah, that's not the corner, that's the center. Um, so I can just come here and manually change it, and then manually change it here. Um, WebStorm actually has a handy feature, though. If you right-click a variable, go to refactor, rename, I can change the name here, and you'll notice it's changing the name everywhere for that variable. And then I just hit enter when I'm done. So refactoring is a handy way to change the variable names, because it'll just change all of them for you. So that's pretty cool. Um, so we got our update position. Now for our initialize bit, um, we're gonna. so we still want to start the game in, with our guy in the middle. doesn't super duper matter, 
because as soon as you put your mouse on it's going to jump to it but just to maintain this so if we want it to be if we want the center of our player to be in the center of the canvas but our x and y is up here we just just like we moved that other point we're going to subtract half the width half the height that's a pretty common thing when you're talking about centering so we're going to do player dot size divide by two and divide by two and actually why don't we move width and height up here first that way we can do this dot width divided by two and this dot height divided by two just so it's a little clearer what's going on so now we have our our um, circles values coming in right so now we have to tweak where we're drawing it a bit because we're still drawing it relative to the center so if now we have this point and we want to get to the center we're just going to add half the width and half the height to the x and y so right here this guy we're going to plus uh, this dot width divided by 2 and on the y plus this dot width divided by or sorry this dot height divided by 2 and actually IntelliJ a lot of times eh, didn't do it there sometimes if you mix y and width and height it'll warn you it can't always tell um, so it couldn't, didn't seem to be able to tell there. Sometimes it can, and that's really handy. Okay, so um, I think we did it right, but let's go tweak our CSS real quick, and we'll make our cursor show up, so I'm just going to delete that line, just so we can tell we're still drawn on the center. So cool, we're still drawn on the center, even though now our player's X and Y is actually the top left of the hitbox instead of the center. So now we have both our enemy and our player with nice, even rectangle values that we can now use to do math to determine our hitbox. And then before I forget, let's turn our cursor back off. Okay, so to do our hitbox, this looks like a crazy person's thing. Okay, um, to do our hitbox, what we're going to do, so we have two, two rectangles. Each one has an X. Actually, let's do this. Do, 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 do. So we have our two rectangles. Each one has an X and a Y. And it has a width, which I'm just going to put W here, because it's hard to write with letters with a mouse, <laughs> and H. I need to get my Wacom tablet hooked up. And then um, this guy has X and Y, and width and height. So if we want to tell if they're overlapping, what we're going to do and please bear with me because I will almost certainly mess at least one part of this up a little bit as we go because it's been a bit. So we can't, we're, we're going to compare this basically in two parts. Instead of trying to do, because um, we can't really do like 2D math at, in one shot. So really what we're going to do, we're going to see, considering just the x-axis, if we like had these on a number line, do these numbers line up at do these numbers overlap at all and do these numbers line up overlap at all and in our case we don't actually care how much they overlap because we're not going to try to bounce or anything we're just going to consider that a hit so we don't we don't actually care about what this distance is we just care if that that distance is there so and really the math is the same for both of these directions we'll just do use x's and widths here and we'll use y's and heights over here but it's the same going to be the same formula we'll just swap out our variables basically and then if we have something here and we have something here then it hits and it has to be both of them because if there's only one of them you know if we had if we consider go back to 2d if we had one like that and one like that they're not actually hitting We'd have something in the x-axis, but we wouldn't have anything in the y-axis. So it has to be both of these. And then the, basically for that, all we do is we check, and here's where I'm going to mess stuff up, but let's see if I can do it. Um, we're going to do, <coughs> excuse me, is the, oh, I always have to think, x plus y, or x plus w of the blue guy, mm minus x of the red mm, let me think hang on we have 
x plus y, or x plus w, sorry. So x plus w, if we're thinking in terms of like a number line, x, ah, why'd you change my colors? No, that's not it. Okay, so if we think in terms of a number line, so x plus y would put us right here, and then if we subtract, this is where I have to think about it, if we do, is it this guy? It's not particularly complicated once you get it done, but you have to think about it for a sec. So that would put us here. So subtracting the two would give us that distance. And so then we want, but we want the distance on the other side. So we subtract all of this from, from the x, from the red x. Is that right? So let's see. So that much would put us here, and then this puts us here. So if we subtract the two, that gives us the amount of this. And then if we subtract x from that, mm, no, we subtract width from that, because that would give us this part of it. And we actually don't care if it's posit which number ends up positive or negative, so we're going to take the absolute value of these because we just care, is the number non, z wait, mm. do we care? Hang on, actually we might care, because if they're not overlapping, we would get this point minus this point, which would put us here, if we subtract with, yeah, actually we do care, sorry. Uh, oh, where's my eraser, is that eraser now? I feel like every time I open Photoshop, they've changed all the icons again. Okay. Um, so, let's see. We would have that point. We would get that distance. And then we said, yeah, so width would be on the left and not absolute value. I think that might be right. Let's find out. And if I'm wrong, we'll change it again. So, I think it's width minus that. And then... So, obviously, we're repeating some variables. We could do some algebra to reduce this thing. Um, on really complicated uh, problems, sometimes you want to reduce it, and sometimes I'll make it clearer, but other times it's better to leave it expanded simply because it's easier to tell kind of what's going on here. Um, but let's just go with the simple for now, and let's see if it even works. So, let's go here. And actually, let's put this in math. And what we'll do is we'll do export const, um, and we'll call it, let's call it hit rec. And what we're going to pass in is going to be two rectangles, A and B. And our rectangle is going to be defined as any object that has x, y width and height. And uh, this is one of the cool things about JavaScript as opposed to other languages is in other languages, if I wanted to pass in some variable, it has to be a real type of that variable. In JavaScript, you can pretty much pass anything in, and if it just happens to have the properties you want, it usually is good enough. So that's why we gave our, pl our player and enemy x, y, width, and height, is they have a rectangle, so they qualify to go into this function and they'll work. So, let's see. So our formula we're trying is going to be b.width minus uh, a dot x plus a dot y or a dot width uh, a dot oh and actually there should be parentheses around both of these sets because we're subtracting them so that matters um, a dot x plus a dot width and parentheses around this minus b dot x plus b dot width okay so this will give us the distance between these and these two points if this guy is first. 
So let's consider it the other way. So if this guy was A, then it would be, we would have this point plus this point, subtract the 2, and it would be like 100 minus 80, it would give us 20, which would still give us that distance. Then if we do the width minus of this guy and say that was um, say that was 80, then we would have, you know, whatever. Eh, might work. Let's try it. So, and what we're, we'll actually return is we'll return another rectangle. So we're going to make a new object here. And so this would be the width of it. And then the height. Same formula. Again, this formula might not be right yet, so don't write it down as a gospel truth. <laughs> I always have to... I always forget this and then figure it out and then I forget it again by the next time I need it. Okay. So width and height and then um, I feel like these guys are math.absolute but anyways, let's see what this gives us for now. So what I'm going to do temporarily let's go pause our enemy because if it's moving it'll be really hard to tell if our math actually worked. Uh, so let's just set our enemy to some value that we can keep track of. Let's do 100. That's a nice e even number. And ditto for the uh, the x. Even Right now it does random. I just set it to 100 too. That way our math gets easier. And then in tick we will do, we'll just do console.log hitbox or hit rect player enemy and we have to import hit rect because it's in a different file. So there we go. And then let's go see what that gives us. Okay, so right now they're a negative number. I'm getting positive, getting positive. Okay, so they actually turn positive. So that was actually what I was wanting. So negative width and height would indicate they're not touching. Positive means they are. So now let's go all the way around the edges and see if it seems to work. So it's still positive, that's good. Still positive, that's good. Still positive, still positive, still positive, still positive. Whoop. All right. Hang on, are we touching? Yeah, we're kind of Actually, so here is where you can kind of see the difference between pixel perfect ber versus hit rec. So in our case here, because we're doing a hit hit box um, collision detection, we're technically hitting here because if you kind of draw an imaginary box around our square, we our squares are overlapping, even though our pixels aren't. So usually you want pixel perfect, um, but again, we want to keep it simple for now. So let's see. So if I go off, they one of them turns negative. Okay, so our formula doesn't quite work because we're still positive here, even though, um, uh, yeah, even though we're not touching. And I think here is the bit where I think if we take, um, uh, yeah. This is where I get it goofy. Let's clear all this out real quick. Or actually, let's, we'll start up a new window. We're almost there, but we have a little bit off. So if we have one here, because you actually usually have to do two different equations and combine them together, because you have the you have a couple different possible scenarios when it comes to how they're overlapping. So you ha have where one is to the left of it. You have where one is to the right of it. So if we consider red is A and blue is B, we have the scenario where A is to the left of B, A is to the right of B, A is completely inside of B, or B is completely inside of A. So we have these four scenarios to consider, and there is a way to get all of, well, there's kind of a way to get all of them in one shot. Uh, I just have to remember. So let's see. So let's solve for this one again. So if we do x plus y, let's forget the math here. Let's see, let's see, it's x plus y, and that puts us, and I'm going to, that puts us here. And then if I take the blue x plus y, or x plus w, so, sorry, 
Hey, is this still overlap? Yeah, uh, yeah, we're still working on the hitbox uh, overlapping thing. Um, okay, so we take that. So that gives us that point. Then subtract the two, and that will give us this distance here. And then if what we care about is this distance, if we take this one's width and subtract it from that, we get this distance here, which is what we want. But then let's apply this formula up here. So if we had, so we have x plus width puts us here. And then we have subtracting this guy. So in this case, so in this case, the second number was bigger. Oh wait, yeah, in this case, the second number was bigger. So um, this was actually a negative number here. And if we subtract width, that actually adds to it. So actually, we didn't get that amount. We got this amount. Um, so this guy is the one really where this formula would work because it would be that would be a that would be this distance would be positive and then if we subtract it from width we get that if we do absolute value of that we get that overall that was absolute value and these do new parentheses and then um, so that would give us that, and then if we subtract it with, but then that creates false positives, I think, too. But let's actually see what happens. Um, so right now, I'm not, I'm, let's not worry about height right now. I'm never going to blank it out, because once we figure out this formula, we'll have the other formula. So if we want absolute value, it's the ABS function on math, and that'll give you the absolute value. And if you're not familiar with what absolute value is, don't remember it from math class. That just, it means it's the number minus any sign, so no negative or positive. So absolute value of 1 is 1, absolute value of negative 1 is 1. Um, so let's see what that gives us. Alright, so again, we're only looking at width right now. So we got negative value, negative value, negative value, positive when we're overlapping, positive, positive, still positive. Okay, this might actually work here. There we go, we went negative. So cool, so I think that might have it. So if we're completely overlapping, we should have about 40 for our width looks like it. I can't quite get my mouse there. There we go. And then as I get off, the number should go down if I go that way, or the number goes down if I go that way. There we go. I think that's our formula. So, copy this guy down here, and that do height, and do y, and do height, and y, and height. Okay. And then... Um, we don't actually need it in this case, but for extra bonus points, so let's go ahead and give our x and, our x and y. So then if we get fancier with how we overlap, like if we want to tell, like, you know, was it a perfect hit where we got in the center or did we just barely nick it or something like that? Uh, let's go ahead and get, we'll get, calculate the x and y too. So the x and y is, we want is basically, so we have our two boxes. Our x and y would be right here. This top point right up here would be our x and y. Because then what that gives us with our x and y width and height, we can get this exact box right here. So, if we come back here. Uh, so let's see. So our x would be, um, and actually, if I'm not crazy, I think our x might actually be really simple. Uh, not quite. So if we do... Um, we want to do here. Sorry, hang on. Okay. If we have ba 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 ba. So, if we were to take let's say the right edge of our circle and subtract that from the width of our hit rec, that would give us our x in this case, but if we scooch over here and did the same thing and took so took the right edge of our circle, subtract that from the width, that puts us somewhere in the middle of the circle. That wouldn't get us right. Because in this case the, the edge of the hit rack would actually be the same as the edge of the circle. In this case the hit rack is the width of the circle 
minus the uh, minus the x of our square. But actually, if I'm not crazy, I think if we do take math.min of our circles x or math.min of our squares x, that gives us our x because over here the x, if I relative to the circle, it's the width minus the x, but really it's the corner of the square. Over here, it's actually it's the edge of the circle. So I think that will give us our nice easy x and y. So math.min a dot x or b dot x, and then y math.min a dot y b dot y. All right, so let's go play around and see if these numbers seem to make sense. So, so I put it right here. So if you remember, we hard-coded our square to 100. So our x should be 100. Uh, wait, no, I'm crazy. I totally said goofy things. Our, it's not the corner of our x. This is the corner of our square. Wait, circle. Which the corner of our circle? Oh, uh, wait. Did I say max here or min? Min. Mm, so let's see. So the corner of the hit rack should be our circle, which doesn't seem to be because, yeah. Well, why doesn't it seem to be? It's a hundred. That's the corner of our square. Oh, right. Um, yeah. Numbers are hard. It's max of the two because our circle is. Our circle is the one further over. So now if we go here, it should be 100. There we go. And if we go over here, it should be whatever our circle is. So I'm about halfway across our square, so that's about 120x. That looks good. And our top of our hit rec should be the square, which, remember, we hard-coded enemy to 100, 100. And if we go down here, um, you know, we're about halfway down, so our y should be about 120. Looking good. If we go here, we should be x about... 80 because we're about halfway off, or sorry, no, 100 because we're on this, we want the square, and then about 124. So I think we got it. That math seems to check out. PHP code that fine. Oh, thank you, DMI. So just shared this code. Wow, that's a lot of code. Yeah, so this code will work. This code is actually, they're not, they're, this is actually a fancy version. This is a version I didn't actually mention. So there's, I mentioned earlier, um, I guess I deleted it. You have two kind of main types of collision detection. You have hitbox detection, and then you have pixel perfect detection. Another one that's kind of in between those, well actually there's two in between those. One is polygon detection, which is what this code does, which is why it's way more complicated than our code. Um, so the uh, polygon would basically, if you imagine your little character, you would have like a mathematically drawn polygon with some number of sides on it. Um, and I think, I'm trying to remember, I don't remember, yeah, I, I think algorithms freak out if you, most algorithms freak out if you have concave points. Not all of them do, I'm sure there's some that can figure it out. Um, so that's one way, and that's kind of on like our spectrum of like, um, easy and fast to h slow and hard, but better. Um, that's kind of third place. And then the other one we have too is kind of a multi-hit box, um, which basically instead of wrapping one hit box around your character, you wrap multiple hit boxes around your character. So you would do like slices of your character and they would be just like wide enough to fit it. And then to test that, you would just you'd loop through and you would see if any of these hitboxes overlap any of the hitboxes from the other guy. Um, so those are kind of your your big four. And like I said, there is a spectrum of easy, fast, but not great because you'll have like a lot of false hits here. To pixel perfect, which is much slower, or in um, in 3D it would be more like mesh perfect. Um, those are slower. But the code is much harder, uh, the, or they run slower, and the code is much harder. But they give much more accurate results. So which one you pick really depends a where you're running it, and then b how important is it that you can really you really hit it. So in like our case, 
It's not super important because we're going to be going like, like hitting a whole bunch of shapes. So we're not going to be able to tell if like we accidentally count this as a hit, and we don't care. Uh, if you're in like a you know a fighting game or something, you're going to care if you just barely dodge that punch or not. So um, and then obviously if you're on lower powered stuff so like if you're on mobile you're probably gonna go to this end of the spectrum just because you don't have the hardware to process that if you're running you know a uh, top of the line Nvidia or AMD graphics card then you're gonna be able to do this kind of stuff just fine um, and yeah and then um, yeah DMI mentioned he also uses it for the Google Map API so uh, yeah determining if you're like in an overlapping polygon of space um, is also another one so that's yeah uh, but yeah cool yeah thank you for sharing that um, cool okay so we got our hitbox yay so now what we can do so now this is this is another great level of extraction here uh, because now um, we have our hit rec and it's kind of a little complicated we never have to worry about this again as long as it's working we don't care what that code is anymore um, so now what we can do is so every tick we're going to check our hit rec. We're going to do hit rec. Or, um, hit equals hit rec player enemy. And then if we hit, we're going to do something else. We're not going to do something. By the way, in my app optimized to performance. Yeah, cool. It's with closest distance. Yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah. There, you can get really fancy and really optimized and stuff. Um, and a lot of, um, if you use game engines in particular too, they'll usually have those functions for you. So, like, I know I play with Unity, and they have functions that I can just be like, "Hey, do my two things hit each other?" And it will tell me or not. And I don't have to worry about that crazy code because. 3D math is hard. I hate 3D math. Okay, so we got our hit. Um, so if we hit, we're going to do something, else we're not. So for now, let's just go simple. We'll just say we hit, else no hit. Just a console log, just to see if our code's working. Oh, um, and actually, so think quite right yet. So our hit rec gives us. Um, a rectangle indicating the overlapping shape. So we ha do have to tell if the width or height is negative. That means we're not actually hitting, but we're still going to get a rectangle. So here we're going to do, um, let's just call it hit. And we'll do A, B here. And so here what we're going to do, we're just going to say, we're going to return, so const, um, Rect equals hit rect a b and actually let's change this name to get hit rec uh, get hit rec and get hit rec just because I keep wanting to name the variable hit rec too and I can't because you can't name things the same or else it gets confused about which thing you're talking about so hit rec hit rec rec but that's not actually our rec code anyways uh, so we'll go here and I'll just say is it is do these two hit one another <coughs> so to determine if they hit one another so we don't care how much they hit each other we just care do they hit each other at all um, actually instead of doing that as a function why don't we just add that as a property here so let's do const rec equals that and then we'll add a property hit and this is going to be a boolean property so a boolean property is a pure straight up true false those are its only two possible values ignoring null um, to do boolean uh, we use boolean operators um, there are really four of them yes maybe um, but we usually only use three of them whoops about 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 blank if you ever want to open up just a blank Chrome window so you have a console to work in, about blank will give you a completely blank page and you can open the console and type whatever you want. Um, so our Boolean logic is, so we have uh, and, or, um, not, 
And then there is another called XOR. I don't think JavaScript has an operator for it. Let me double check before I say that, though. OK, good. Does not have an XOR operator. Didn't think so. Yay, I know JavaScript. <laughs> so, um, so, but XOR would be your third one. So and or not an XOR. Um, these are your Boolean logic operators. Uh, this applies more to even just programming, so you also use this in like electrical engineering and stuff. And is basically if the thing on the left and the thing on the right is true, it's true. If either one of those isn't, so like true and false ends up being false. So if either side or both sides is not true in an and, it's altogether not true. And or if one side or the other is true, then they're both true. So if you compare and contrast, oops, and I totally typed and there. If you compare and contrast here, we got true and false is false, true or false is true. Not, it just takes one value and turns it into the opposite. So like not true is false or not false is true. And then XOR, which again, we don't have a JavaScript operator, but if you needed an XOR, XOR is one or the other only. So for OR, if it's true or true, it's still true because at least one of them is true. For XOR, one, it has to be one and only one side of it is true. So true or false is true, but true or sorry, true XOR is false and true, but true XOR true is false because it has to be only one of these is OR. So those are our four Boolean operators. Like I said, they apply to more for code. You can actually represent XOR. XOR would be, if you needed it in JavaScript, would be true or it would be like A or B and not A and B. So this equals XOR. Uh, that's basically what it's doing. So in JavaScript, but I I couldn't tell you the last time I used XOR. Um, use it a lot more in electrical engineering. You don't use it very often in programming, uh, at least not the program kind of programming I do. So in JavaScript, our symbols for these, we don't use the words. We use two ampersands two and signs are and. For or, we use two pipes. And then for not, we use an exclamation mark. So if I wanted to see like uh, true and false, that's false. Um, if I wanted to do not true, that's true. If I wanted to do not false, that's fa uh, not false is true, etc., etc. And we could also start putting these together. So I can do like true and false or uh, true and true. So just like math, you do parentheses first, starting inner to outer. So this bit would be false. This would be true. False or true is true. So it's quite useful. Ah, good call. Yeah. Um, M420P just pointed out XOR is quite useful if you do bitwise manipulations. That's definitely true. I'm not going to talk about bitwise operations right now, but that's kind of a, it's a cool way where you can, um, uh, maybe oversimplifying a bit, but you can basically stick a bunch of values into one number. So like if you had like four options, you can kind of, that are all true, false, you can kind of smash them into one value. That's oversimplifying it a bit, but, um, but yeah, but yeah, XORs are definitely useful there. Um, okay, cool. So yeah, so obviously here I'm just doing a bunch of true, false, true, false, true, false. Uh, our real code, we're not going to just have trues and falses flying everywhere. So we also can do, um, we have an, uh, I always get them mixed up. So since I'm explaining them to you, let's make sure I use the right words for the right ones. Um, so in JavaScript, you have two equal signs and three equal signs, and they both work kind of similar, but they have some key differences. Uh, so two equal signs is the equality operator, and that would make this the other the uh, equivalent, or the, um, yeah, the other one. Where is it? Wait, where's my triple equal sign? There, strict equality, uh, or identity. 
So the difference between the two is subtle, and it really only comes into play when you're dealing with some, uh, some, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> according to Bo, no, he says exactly where I'm going, and I'm not going to dive too deep into it. Uh, for now, I'm just going to say JavaScript has some interesting quirks, like an empty array equals false is true, or uh, null equals, or no, not null, uh, false equals empty string is true, or uh, empty string and zero is true. Bunch of weird little quirks. Um, those are definitely important in a lot of cases. For our case, they're not going to be important. So for right now, we'll just say, for right now, always use three equal signs because three equal signs is the identity operator. So it will actually make sure that the two things are really the same thing, not that they're kind of the same thing, which is what these guys do. So for now, just remember, always use three equal signs. I'm sure this will come back up at some point because it does matter. It just doesn't matter for our current program. And as a canon with Bo pointed out, how many hours do I have? It's tricky and complicated and goofy, and there's, there is a rhyme and reason, but nobody understands it. Um, okay, cool. So what we're going to do is we're going to go, and we're going to do, so for hit, so we need to determine. So our hit is if our width is greater than 0 and our height is greater than 0, hit is true. So what we can do is we'll do just pretty much exactly how I said it. Rec.width is greater than 0, so and rec.height is greater than 0. So, um, yeah, so your comparison operators along with the two equal signs, which we pretend doesn't exist right now, and the three equal signs, we also have not equal. So 5 not equal 4 is true, does the exact opposite of the equal. Uh, we also have not equal equal, which is the same as the three equals. So again, we're going to pretend this one doesn't exist for now, and we're always going to do exclamation two equals if we need that. Uh, we also have all your favorite math ones, um, greater than, less than. We also have greater than or equal to, and um, less than or equal to. And blah, 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 blah. since we have this up, let's scroll through it and make sure I didn't forget any of them. Let's see, we got eh, no handy dandy list at the top. That one, that one, that one, that one, that one, that one. Okay, yeah, so that should be it. Okay, um, so this just an um, order of operations. So if you remember in math, you have order operations. So you have like, um, when you have like an equation like uh, one plus two times three, you always do order of operations says you do your multiplication first so you would do six plus one and you wouldn't do three times three and nine um, and mess it up like the internet like half the people on the internet do on those stupid polls that they do um, we also have order operations for all the other operators we have um, I won't talk about the whole darn list because there's quite a few operators and even I don't know all of them when you start mixing and matching but for our purposes the greater than signs the the, the comparison ones will uh, work before the uh, the boolean operators so what we're essentially doing here is we're checking this and that's going to be say that's true and then we'll check this and then we'll say that's true so then true and true is true or if one of them's false it'll be false so this rec.hit will give us either true or false so we'll be able to use that to check did we hit without having to do this little formula wherever we want to know that and then we'll just make sure we re remember to return our rec because we want to be able to get this value and we can't do a single line thing because we're doing multiple lines in here, so we can't crunch it down like that. So we'll leave it just like that. Okay, so now let's flip back here. So we'll do hit rec, and we'll do hit rec dot hit. So now that'll tell us did we actually hit or not. And now, if we flip over to our code, no hit, no hit, no hit, mouse it over, and we're hitting, we're hitting, we're hitting, no hit, no hit, no hit. Yay, so we got hitting. Cool. Now then, all right, let's go. So really what we want to do is we'll say, well, mm, let's see. All right. So really for now, what we'll do for now is we'll, when we hit the enemy, we want to destroy the enemy. Um, right now, that's a little tricky. We only really have one enemy. So let's go ahead. There's a table somewhere for order of, 
Yes. Yeah, we can pull that up. Uh, MDM order of operations. Yeah, so according to Bo pointed out, there is this table here. Um, <laughs> it only has 20 different groups of things, and then each one of those groups has multiple things. So if you would like to memorize this, feel free. You might be the first person in history to do so. Um, but yeah, so but if you are ever curious, um, most of it does what you want. I think usually the bitwise are the only ones I usually get tripped up on because they actually come before some other stuff, and I always forget and have to wrap stuff up. Um, but yeah, there's this fun little table here. Um, so, all right, so let's go back to here. All right, so we want to destroy our enemy. It's hard to destroy our enemy when we only have one enemy, though. So what we're going to do, let's change it so now we'll start having multiple enemies. So we're gonna, we'll go ahead and remove our hard code bit. And so now, instead of having one enemy, so, so far we've only dealt with one of things in a variable. If we want to have multiple things, like we want to have a list or an, of values, so like, um, oh, let's get off of there, what's that count? Let's say I want to keep track of three numbers together. I can do what's called an array. An array is literally just a list or collection of elements all together. So this creates an array with one, two, and three in it. And we can actually add things to an array. So if I do one, two, three. So I can use the push operator, or push function, to push a value onto it. Now if I look at A, we have one, two, three, four. There's also the uh, unshift operator which will put stuff on f in on the front of it so you can see the five end up on the front and then they each have opposites to get things off too so for push the op the to take one off is pop and what that'll do is it'll pop the last one of these off of the array so it'll take it out and it'll actually give us back that number so you'll see when I hit this we'll output four <coughs> excuse me and then if I check the array four is gone there so push and pop go together and then the opposite of unshift is shift so shift will do the same thing as pop except it's going to do it from the front so shift will output five here <coughs> and then we get um, five is off our array so what we're going to use an array for is we're going to have an array of enemies so every time we create an enemy we're going to add it to the array. Every time we destroy an enemy, we're going to take it out of the array. And then <coughs> um, once we take it out, we won't be drawing it anymore. So we'll only be drawing every enemy in the array. <coughs> so let's go ahead. Let's go to enemy first. Let's create a static method called create. And the reason it's static is because I'm going to use this method to create the enemy. So the enemy doesn't exist yet, so it can't be a member method or a, um, <coughs> well, yeah, just a method. Uh, so it's going to be a static method. Sorry, give me one sec. Let me take a drink. <coughs> so M420P asked what um, difference between, or what const prefix does. According to Bo said, it lets it let's make it only assemble once. Um, so um, in C, let's see. So in C, you um, C is a strongly typed, so you would have like data type equals something like that. JavaScript is uh, loosely typed, so we don't declare the type. So we either use the keyword let or const, and um, <coughs> So both of these will create a variable. The difference between them, if you do const, you can't reassign it. So like if I try that, um, that's a uh, an exception. You can see it's giving red line. But I can change i. So that's the difference between the two. Yeah, yeah. According, according to Bo mentioned, um, it is actually a performance uh, optimization as well. Um, and it's also a safeguard against you accidentally changing stuff you didn't mean to change. So picking const, using const when you need to is definitely preferable. Uh, my general rule of thumb between picking const and lets is I always start with const, and then if I dis discover I need to be able to change it, I'll change it to let back um, if I'm not sure. So I always start with const. Okay. So let's create 
So we're not going to create one enemy up front anymore. We're going to create our array of enemies. And to create an, an empty array with nothing in it, we just do square brackets. So just like back here, I use square brackets to put stuff in it. I'm doing the same square brackets. I'm just not putting anything in it. So we're going to get an array with nothing in it. <coughs> and now one interesting thing about how, um, yeah, uh, M420 just pointed out the interesting thing I was just about to mention. So I said const, you can't reassign enemies, so I can't do like enemies equals something else. But because array is an object, I can still change the array attached to the object. So just like in this example where I did A here, I did A.push. That changed what A was, but it didn't actually change A itself. A is still the same array. That array just has more in it. So, um, yeah. Um, yeah, and according to Bo mentioned, there is a way to stop this. There's an object.freeze, uh, which you can use. Um, and, yeah, I think you're right. Uh, it is shallow immutability, which means it only freezes the top layer. So if you wanted to freeze everything in it, you have to... You have to go in every single layer of something and freeze each layer individually. Um, <coughs> usually, there's not a huge ton of reason to freeze. Uh, I've tried. I've played around with like being super strict about when I freeze and whatnot, um, and really kind of bulks up your code. But there are definitely some use cases where it does make a lot of sense. Um, we won't have any in this game, I don't think, though. Um, and uh, just to mention. The, immuta the immutable word that, according to Bo mentioned, um, elements have are either immutable or immutable. So mutable, like as like same root or uh, yeah same root as mutation or uh, so can you change it? Can you mutate it? And then immutable is just the opposite. You can't mutate it. You can't change it. Uh, so immutable and immutable are the the fancy programming terms we use. Um, okay, so we made our empty array of enemies. And now let's let's go and let's say <coughs> let's see. So when we generate an enemy, we can um, um, when we make an enemy, we'll we have a di couple different ways we could decide when we want to decide it's time to make a new enemy. For now, just to keep it simple, let's just pick a random number. And if that random number happens to be less than 0.2, uh, we'll make a new enemy. Uh, so if you remember, math random gives us a number between 0 and 1, a decimal number. So less than 0.2 means we have a roughly 20% chance on every tick to create an enemy. That's probably going to be way too high, but we'll play with it. Um, and then DMI just asks, so if it is an array, you can't make it an integer later. Yeah, that's true if it's a const. Uh, if it was a let, you can actually change types. And that's one of those things that sometimes people get themselves in trouble because they, you generally, as a JavaScript will totally let you change let. So like if I do let a, I'm starting as an array. I want it to be five. It's now five. I make it a string. It's now a string. I make it undefined. It's now a uh, I don't know what are crazy things that exist. You can change it. JavaScript is perfectly happy letting you. I strongly, strongly recommend, though, unless you have a very good reason, don't do this. This is one of the things where sometimes you'll hear people bashing JavaScript for being ugly or messy or something, and really it's all untyped languages, or uh, loosely typed languages that have the same thing. Um, that's a lot of, that's mainly because people will be mixing up their code and creating ugly things, and so then it's like, <coughs> you know, I have A, and I'm some random place in my code, but A is constantly changing what it is. I have no clue what it is at that point in time, so how the heck am I going to get the code right? Yeah, exactly. According to Bo said, JavaScript's only as ugly as your code discipline. Agree 100%. Um, so yeah, so usually if you make an ob a variable and it's one data type, keep it that data type. So if you start it out as a number, make it only be a number. And if you need a string suddenly, make a new variable for, make a new variable to, to hold that string. Okay, so we're going to randomly create an enemy every so often. We're going to use that new enemy.create function we, and it, we declared. We haven't actually implemented yet. And we're going to push the enemy we create onto our array here. So, here we go. And then let's go <coughs> implement this. So our enemy.create stuff 
basically we're just going to set for now we'll keep it simple we'll have them all coming from the top so we're gonna just do um, const enemy equals new enemy <coughs> then we're gonna do enemy dot x equals so this was our randoming randomizing code we had and then here I'm in a static method so I can't actually use this because I'm not part of an object I'm part of the blueprint so I need to refer to um, this enemy here for, to get this enemy max x and we're going to change some of this stuff later but for now this is good so <coughs> now every time I call this function it's going to give me a new enemy that actually wait I don't even need that code right now because we have that code let's just return new enemy because it'll actually run that same code right here we're going to change that up and make it fancy later but for now this is good enough um, so we'll get a new enemy at some random x at the top of the screen basically and then we'll also and so this function because it's only returning a thing it's one line let's clean let's crunch that up a bit and so our function just creates a new enemy so yay uh, the way this there, that I don't actually know why it allows, but it doesn't work with let. Interesting. I'm not sure about that. <coughs> that var versus let thing. I generally try to keep var out of any program that's modern enough to have let. Some people aren't that lucky. Um, okay, cool. So we'll create an enemy every time. And now, so let's let's get rid of this code for now, or we'll comment it out. <coughs> so now we have an array of enemies so every every tick we have a roughly 20 percent chance of maybe creating an enemy we'll create the enemy then down here in our draw instead of um, so we don't have the one enemy anymore we want to draw all the enemies so what we're going to do is we're going to loop through the enemies <coughs> so again loop just like the game loop before it basically it runs the code for when you're dealing with an array it'll run the loop for every element in that array so like if I have a, an array with one two three <coughs> there's a couple different functions you can use to loop that are slightly different. There's map, flat map, um, reduce, and for each. We're going to use for each right now. And all for each will do is it's going to loop through each element in this array. And I pass in a function here. And so my function, it's going to give me the value that it took off of here. And then it's going to and then I it's just gonna do some random thing I do so like if I wanted to like say console.log that V I can do that so it'll just go through and output each one so here what we're gonna do we're gonna do enemies dot for each and we're gonna do enemy because that'll be a thing we're gonna call enemy dot draw right here and we're gonna need to pass in the context <coughs> so it's just going for every enemy so for each enemy we're going to call enemy.draw. Um, and I'll draw all of our enemies. So now, let's see, do we have some chaos going on? Oh, <laughs> so I don't know if you can see it. It's like a one pixel line where we're ever so slightly overlapping at the top here. I can see we're generating a whole bunch of enemies up there, but we don't have our move code because we commented this guy out because it doesn't work anymore. So in our tick, just like down here, we're going to do enemies dot for each enemy. <coughs> enemy dot y plus equals 10 so we'll get them all to move so now it's raining enemies yay links allowed uh, do you mean links in the chat according to Bo not sure uh, yeah I haven't turned them off so you should be allowed uh, someone posted one earlier alright so cool so we're raining enemies here so one thing Post to a JS fiddle. Let's see what we've got going on here. Uh, ensure fails. Oh, interesting. Use global scope var and ensure create variable. Interesting. So this is that edge case he was talking about. Um, this won't work with let, however. It kind of makes sense because they're in the scope of let, but I think the var being behavior is interesting. Yeah, interesting. So Basically what's happening is with var, it kind of does this funny thing where it can essentially refer to itself before when you're creating it. Whereas let, you can't, <coughs> it won't let you refer to itself before it's created. So you could do like this, but yeah, that's interesting. I didn't actually know that one. Huh, neat. <coughs> Everyone's learning something. Awesome. 
Uh, I like learning new new little tidbits I didn't know. Cool, thank you. Um, okay, so now it's raining enemies. If I keep kept letting this run, in effect, you can kind of see it a bit. All of these enemies, once they hit the bottom here, they're off screen. So once they're off screen, there's no way I could possibly ever interact with them. But they still actually exist, and in fact, they're still actually drawing. So if I let this run long enough, we'd end up with so many enemies that it would either crash or it would like slowly grind to a halt because there's just so much going on. Because even though they're off the screen, we're still drawing them. So let's go ahead, and in our tick, let's go ahead and actually we'll update this guy right here. So after we move it 10, let's check if the enemy has gotten off the screen, let's d destroy the enemy because it's gone. So what we'll do, we'll do if... So if I want to check a condition and do code, and I used it here, but I didn't explain it. So if lets me declare, <coughs> de declare basically if, and then I have some Boolean condition in here. So in this case, we'll check if enemy y plus enemy height is greater than uh, canvas height. So that would be like, um, so here's our canvas, and I don't know why we're so light now. Um, and then if our enemy was right here, that would be enemy y. Oh, sorry, we don't need height there. So just if the enemy y gets past canvas height. Um, yeah, a lot of times when you're doing this stuff, it really helps to have a pad of paper and sketch things out because, you know, I just caught a bug right there before I even did it just because I was drawing the code. Okay, so if our enemy y is greater than our canvas height. That means our enemy is now off the screen and we can never interact with it. So we're going to remove it. So when I was doing our, our array introduction, I, I introduced pop and, shi uh, uh, pop and shift as two ways to get things off an array. That lets me get things off of the start or end of the array. If I want to get things out of the middle of the array, I'm going to use splice. So splice, so let's make an array. So with an array, you have indexes, uh, which is just the position the element is in the array. Arrays start counting at zero. There are some languages that use start one. Those languages are wrong. Don't use those languages. Don't know any of them off the top of my head, but they're wrong. Uh, arrays start at zero. And I can refer to an index by doing a square bracket zero. And that'll give me the zeroth element. So it'll give me that. Or like if I wanted zero, one, two, three. If I do a three, that'll give me four. So this is the index. If I want to splice something, what I do is I do a.splice, and then I give it the start index. So like say, let's get the t the, this 3 out of here. So that's index 0, 1, 2. So index 2. And then delete count. So that's how many records I want to delete. If I just want to delete the 3 out of here, I just want to delete one record. And then you can also the splice also lets you put new things in that spot as well, and you could even delete nothing and put new things in. We're not going to do that, so we're not going to give anything for that. So I'm just going to do a splice, the second element, or the the yeah, the second element, which is r really the third element, or the so the second in, the element in index two, we'll say, and I'm going to delete one. I'm going to run that. Splice itself will return the thing we took out, but then if I look at a, we can see three came out of there, and then. Just to show you real quick, I can also technically delete multiple things. So if I wanted, to, if I said like splice three, I just chopped off, starting here, I chopped off three things, and then A only has that left. But for our code, we're just going to splice one. So if our enemy's gone too far, we're going to go to enemies.splice. And then for all of these loop functions, or most of them at least, um, if you do the second a second parameter, it'll tell you the index of the, the thing it just gave you. So I can add a second parameter here, and then I'll know the index of my enemy. So I want to splice that index, and I want to delete one. So now it should delete my enemy. So what we can do to test is let's output. If we do an array.length, that tells us how many things are in that array. So I'm going to comment out this code, so this code won't be doing anything. Um, and let's just watch our enemy count before we do the cleanup code. So we're at 3, 10, 11, 12, 14, 17, 23, 28. And remember, I cut off the, the oh, actually, we should keep the move part. <laughs> That's a weirder example if I don't have the move part. There we go. OK. So it's raining enemies. So 
7, 10, 12, 13, 14, 16, 19, 20, 21, 25, 20, 30, 30. It keeps going up. You can see it never goes down. It's never going to go down. It's just going to keep counting up. So now I'm going to do this code. And if this code works, what should happen is we'll go up a bit and then we'll kind of hit an equilibrium where we're only like plus or minus a handful of numbers because we're adding new ones but we're also taking them out so we won't keep going up constantly. So let's see if this code works. So we're at 3, 5, 7, 10, 14, 19, 20, 21, 20, blah, blah, blah. Okay. So there we go. So you can see now we've kind of hit an equilibrium. We're kind of hovering in like the 20 range. They've been down to like I saw 14 there and 21, 22. So we've kind of hit an equilibrium. So that lets us know that we're definitely deleting these guys off and only what's on screen and what is up here exists still. So cool. So that way we won't crash. And what we'll do eventually it's, um, is, because if you remember, or if you were here at the beginning of the stream when I was talking about it, so our, our overall game is we're going to have these shapes coming in from all sides, and we're going to hit them to get points. If they make it to the other side on us, we lose a life or whatever. So if we like miss like three shapes or five shapes, whatever number we'll play with it, um, we lose. So that would be where we have this miscount here. So let's put a little note to remind us for when we get to that point. Add miscode here. Um, and it's real handy in, mo in pretty much all IDs or um, if you add a comment with to do in it, they'll usually have some kind of sum UI that lets you find all the to do's in your code. And so it's a real easy way to remind you what things you wanted to do, do. So like as you're working, you're like, oh, I need to come back and do this, but you want to go do this instead. You can put a little to do to remind you. So it's real handy to do that as you're working on code to keep track of what you got, what you have going on, what you need to do. Okay. <coughs> so we have that. So we have all of our enemies doing their thing. Now let's come in here. So now let's also, so we're checking each of our enemies. <coughs> let's also in here check if our player hit the enemy. So we can grab this code. Let's uncomment it. I'm going to move it up here. So we'll check if we've hit a thing or not. So, and just ugly version. So we got a bunch of no hits and hits because some of them were hit and some of them were not. So that part's working. So cool. And now we're going to come in here and we're going to. So if we hit, we're going to also splice that out. So same splice code we used here. And then if we miss, we're not actually going to do anything, because who cares? <coughs> and I totally crashed it, because that's way too many commits. There we go. OK, so now you can see I'm hitting them, and they're popping out of existence. So cool. That's working. Yay. So now I can kill stuff. OK. So now, if we take a look here, though, I have two bits of code that are actually doing the same exact thing. Usually when that's happening, that means you want to refactor something somewhere. Uh, what you refactor is going to depend on the code and stuff. In this case, I think we should just, we'll move this guy up here. And we do, so, <coughs> if you remember, I said normally we want to put variables at the top of our stuff to keep it organized. This is one of those cases where we can't actually do that. Because we want to make sure we move our enemy before we calculate the hit rec, or else we'll be off 10 pixels. So, a little bit of a deviance from the roll, but that's okay, because we want that. And then here we're going to do if the enemy's off the screen or <coughs> we hit rec dot hit then we're going to splice and we may actually separate these back out and in fact we very likely will because we don't want to do the miscode uh, if enemy is off screen because we don't want to do the miscode if we hit it because we didn't miss it um, but we do want to do the splicing but we'll deal with that in a sec and then likewise to do add hit code here if enemy was hit. So we're probably, a game's not much, not much po point to a game if you just sit here and endlessly hit squares forever. So we'll probably add like say a point system and so if we hit an enemy we would get points and then you can compete for high scores and whatnot. Uh, but before that, let's go ahead, the game design, so right now we have them coming from this side, but really I think it would be more interesting if we had them coming from all sides to start with. So we'll do over an enemy <coughs> so we had this create method and we're going to change this guy up a bit now so now let's get rid of well not get rid of I'm going to move this code up here I'm going to stick it in comment for a second just to hold it 
And by default now, we're going to initialize our enemies with just 0 for its x and y. And then I'm going to move these guys back down. And now we're not going to worry about that guy. OK. So now all of our enemies are going to start in the same place, because when we create, use color create, it's going to create them in a random place. So we have four different places we can create them. And then also, depending where we create it, we have to move it a different way. So right now, all of the enemies are moving down, because they start from the top and they move down. So that means all of them are plus xing. But if it starts from the bottom, it can't plus x, because then it's going to keep going down and we're never going to see it. Or if it's here, it'll just go that way. We would want this one to move that way, this guy to keep moving that way, so these would be, or sorry, this is plus y. Uh, this guy would be plus x. If it starts from the left, this would be minus x. This would be minus y. So if we start from the bottom, we want to do minus y. So what we're going to do, <coughs> let's give it a, um, a couple ways to represent this. The fancy way would be to have a vector a vector is basically um, indicates a director direction and like a length. Uh, well, yeah, technically it's a point of length, but program uh, like three D fancy math programming, you'd use a vector. This isn't fancy math programming right now, so we're gonna go kind of lower tech. We'll have a uh, <coughs> a speed x and a speed y. And so what we'll do is when we set its starting position, we'll also set a speed. And then we can go ahead here. So instead of moving the enemy by a fixed 10 here, we're going to move it by its <coughs> speed y. And we'll also move it by its speed x. So now, so for each direction, one of these will be a zero, so it won't move in that direction, and the other one will either be a positive or negative number based on it. So let's go ahead. So when we create, we'll first we'll randomly pick our direction. So we could do, <coughs> and we're going to do different logic for each. So we could do an if statement and be like, we could calculate some value, blah, blah, blah. And we could be like, if a equals zero, do one thing. And then we can do an else if, which an else if chains things together. So if you have else, it runs if this isn't true. If you have else if, you give it another condition, and you keep going, and 3 equals, because we're pretending 2 equals doesn't exist. Um, and then you can keep changing. So we could do that. But if you have a bunch of this statements, and they're all referring to the same value, you can actually use a switch statement instead. So the switch statement looks like this. The value goes up here, and then you have cases. <coughs> and those cases are what this value does. So it'll run the, this case if this value equals this value. And cases, you have to have a break. And any number of lines you have, it'll run until it hits the break, basically. So <coughs> in our case, we'll have four directions. So we'll just generate a number between uh, one and f uh, 0 and 4. And we'll apply different logic based on that. And so instead of a 1 here, we'll just do math.random. And then, so remember, that's a decimal number between 0 and 1. So times 4. So that'll give us a number greater than 0, but less than or equal to 4. And then we don't want a decimal number because these have to be exact matches. So we're going to do math.floor. And so that would take, we would have like 0 to like 3.99999. Just going to chop the decimals off. So we have a nice even number between 0 and 3. So that's exactly what we want for our cases. So then, <coughs> and it doesn't really matter which number we link to which direction. So we'll just, let's do top, bottom first, and then we'll do left, right. So if it's top, we'll just put comments here so we can remember. Top, bottom, left, right. So if it's top, we're going to leave the, so top is y plus, so we're not going to change our x, we're just going to change our y. So, our, our speed y. So, um, oh, and we have to create our enemy first. So, const enemy equals new enemy up here. Get rid of this guy. Okay, so enemy dot speed y. And for now, we'll just keep hard coding these to 10. We'll do something more interesting with this uh, later. Probably not today, though, because we're at three and a half hours, so kind of a long stream. Okay, so enemy.speedy, and then bottom would be just that, 
minus, and then left oops, would be, if you remember, that's x plus. So positive x. And actually, instead of, we don't really want to add to that. We want to set them directly. So that, 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 no sign. And then enemy dot speed x equals minus 10. And that should be x. So that sets the speed. We'll have to head to bed. Thank you, M420. Thanks for joining. Uh, Fort King. Uh, we totally could do stuff in Java, too. Um, yeah, I'm open to pretty much any language, any projects. Yeah, actually, that's a good time to mention. If anyone has any ideas or thoughts about what they'd like to do, um, I am totally uh, open to ideas and stuff. Um, I kind of have a backlog of them, but I'm sure I will run out sooner rather than later. So I would love for you guys to propose ideas and stuff. So if you have any thoughts or ideas, please shoot it to me in chat or Twitter or wherever uh, you can. Um, Okay, so we have our speed. Now we need to specify which side it's on. So if it's on top, we want our y to start off at negative um, enemy dot height, because we want it to be, so if zero was right here, minusing height will shove it just off screen. And then bottom will be <coughs> equal to, um, canvas height, which we actually don't have pulled in at the moment. So let's pull that in. We've got to import that. Because our x, if we put it right here, canvas height would be our y, and that would get us right there. And then basically ditto for these guys, except we're going to use width, so and x instead. So for left, it'll be negative enemy width. And then for right, it will be uh, canvas width. So I'll get it just off screen and it will um, position it right for the one side and then we want to randomize the other side. So that's where this guy will come back into play. And let's go ahead and we'll just generate a um, mm, let's call it random position. Because it doesn't actually matter because right now our enemy is square so we may have to change this in the future. But for now um, <coughs> we don't have to worry about that. So um, we'll do, um, yeah, sorry, my brain just broke. Uh, max x is, um, oh, actually, no, we do need to calculate that one on one because it'll depend on canvas width and height. And that's scary right now, but that probably, that might not last. So we'll go ahead and just calculate each one individually. So boom. And this guy, so let's do a, const max x equals canvas width minus enemy dot width and then now we don't have to have the this dot anymore be a GPS tracker for Java for your phone it's GPS that'd be pretty cool and let us pull in some interesting stuff um okay um Let me speed. Okay, yeah. So we'll do this. Same bit for this guy, and we'll probably come in here again and refactor it. But you never want to over, um, uh, refactor too often. Try to optimize your code too often, because uh, you'll end up wasting a lot of time. Because you know uh, you've probably seen me just in this little bit of coding. I'll like type something. And I'm like, eh, that doesn't really do what I wanted, or eh, that doesn't really that. It's not what I wanted, and I'll change my mind. So if you spend too much time trying to find the exact perfect spot for every little bit of code up front, you're going to just end up wasting a lot of time. So I always recommend, you know, just kind of get something out, and then when you get to a good point, uh, like we did earlier today when we f had our initial index, do a wave of refactor, and then write a bunch of code, and then do a wave of refactor, and you just keep cycling around like that. And that way you're not spinning your wheels doing some refactoring for code you may delete 30 seconds later. Um, Okay, so y, y, and then this guy needs to be canvas.height minus enemy height. Ditto for this guy. And da, 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 if I haven't made a major tactical error, that might work. And it did not. 
let's see, what do we got here? Enemy x plus equals enemy dot speed. But what does it say here? Cannot read property x of undefined. Interesting. So, cannot read uh, x of undefined means the thing that we're trying to read x from is undefined. So that's saying enemy is undefined. So, ah, okay. <coughs> so, we have two things going on here. One, um, <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, Fort King Hell just shared that he spent so much time perfecting code that he burns out and gives up on the project. I know that feeling. Um, uh, yeah, so, okay, we have two things going on that are goofing us up. So one are telling if the enemy's off the screen logic. Now it's too simple because this logic is, tr is true for a bunch of enemies, so we may kill them off before we ever see them. So let's go ahead, we'll remove that logic for now. We're going to have to come back and put something back in place for that, so let's add a to-do. Uh, to-do, implement smarter... Um, smarter off-screen logic, and then I'm going to move this to-do right next to that guy. <coughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, according to Bo said finishing is a skill, got to practice that too. That's true. It can be tough, the finishing touches. There's um, it's a thing called the 80-20 rule. It's not strictly a programming thing, but I hear it a lot with programming. Basically, it's something like 80% of the work takes 20% of the time, and then the last 20% of the work takes 80% of the time. Because finishing it up and getting it all the little fine-tuning usually takes more than the bulk of stuff does. Um, yeah, and there's never a code base anywhere that couldn't use more work. Definitely true, according to Bo. Yeah, um, yeah when you're working in a professional setting, you kind of have to... Everything is a balancing act, because there's so many hours in the day. And really, even at home, I mean... You know, I still, there's still only 24 hours in the day. Uh, so, you know, it's always a balancing act. It's like, okay, what's, I have, you know, this amount of time, what's the most important thing to do? Because really, my projects at work, you know, they're so huge, I could s sit there and refactor them for the next year and not run out of stuff. But is sitting there refactoring that better than, you know, implementing new features and stuff? So coding is definitely just a series of trade-offs. Uh, so getting good at picking the right one and or even being able to justify your decision that in and of itself is a very valuable skill and that really that's something that starts to separate in a professional settings the amateurs from the professionals um, so yeah okay so cool so we got that all right so let's do this again let's see what's happening all right cannot read property x fun to find okay we still have that going on um Let's actually remove this for just a second. So I think what might be going on... Oh, no. I know what's going on here. Uh, we forgot to return our enemy down here. So when we called our create function, we didn't return anything. So we just put nothing in the array. We put what's called undefined. And undefined is like... So if I do let A and I call A, it's undefined. I've never given a value. Same with a function. <laughs> if I call a function that doesn't return anything, it returns undefined. So what I was doing in my array is I was basically putting a whole bunch of undefines. And so when I tried to get x, it was saying the thing you're trying to get x off of is undefined, which it was because I forgot to return it. So let's refresh again. There we go. Look at that. We got them coming from all sides, and we can hit and kill them. Cool. Um, so now let's go and let's re-implement this code real quick to um, know when to kill them. So our code before was, just to remind, was if enemy.y is greater than canvas.height. The idea is still the same, but we ha now have four versions of that. So what we're going to do is if, so we ha we'll base this off of the speed. So if enemy y is any dot, blah, can't talk now. Enemy dot speed y is greater than zero, so that would be moving down because x moves down. So if we're moving down, then and enemy dot y canvas is greater than height, so, which would be our condition for our enemy falling off the screen. Then we can we'll do that, and then we could do an or. Um, 
enemy dot speed y is less than zero and enemy dot y is less than negative enemy dot height is what that one would be. Um, and we could keep going. So that's actually one way to do it. A nifty other way to do it though is we can actually do a hit rec just like we did with um, with do with our player because if you think about it we can define our canvas as a hit rec or a, a hitbox and we can be like okay if the enemy is intersecting our our big rectangle it's still on screen if it's not intersecting anymore it's off screen that's a whole lot of less code because we already have that hit rec calculated so let's rename this guy because we're going to do two different ones now so we'll name that one player and then we'll call do this one canvas hit rec get hit rec and then we'll have enemy as one thing and then we don't currently have a actual square for this so we'll just create one or a a object for this, a rectangle object for this. So we'll just create one real quick here on the fly. And we'll probably change this down the line, but again, don't want to refactor too soon. If it works, it's good enough for now. So player hit rec and then canvas hit rec. So we're not going to need this anymore. So if player hit rec dot hit or, and in this case for the canvas, we want to remove it when it doesn't hit anymore. So or not canvas hit. And then let's do that console log that we did to count the number of enemies to see if this code is working. Oop, that ain't what I wanted. This is this is outputting the array itself instead of array.length. That's going to slow down my tab real quick cuz console is kind of um kind of expensive memory wise. So if you ever are running your game and it's starting to get real sluggish and you're outputting a lot of console stuff, it might just be your console logging that's slowing you down. It might not be your real code. So you can close console and if it speeds back up, that's how you'll know real quick if it's your console or not. Okay, so, and let's look at our count. So it looks like we hit equilibrium, so cool. So it looks like it's working and I don't see any enemies that are just like popping out of the distance. So it looks like I'm not removing them too soon. So I think we're working pretty cool, pretty good. Um, so now, and now I can just keep hitting them, and then let's do one last thing, and then I think we're going to have to call it night, because, yeah. Um, so let's go ahead, we'll implement a score and a miscount, and we'll show those on the screen. We won't do like a game over screen or anything yet, because that's going to implement, require some code, but we can just, for now, we'll just keep track of our score, and we'll keep track of our misses. So we'll start, well, whoops, so the score, we're going to constantly add to it. So that needs to be a let, so we can change it. Ditto for misses. So uh, score, misses. So then we'll just come down here. So if player hit ret dot hit, then we're going to do score plus, and we'll just do plus one for now. We may change that again later too. Um, if you remember, I said there were, Two, there were, I showed you two ways to do math. You can do like that, or you can do like this. In the case where you're adding or removing exactly one, you can actually do plus plus or minus minus. Um, those are the that the hit plus plus and minus minus are increment operators. So that'll either add. So this is the same as this, which is the same as this. Uh, the there is one kind of quirk with these guys, so there's actually the increment operator can actually come before or after. Most of the time it doesn't matter. Uh, I almost always do after. But the funny thing is, if I do something like um, uh, b -b 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 what's something that it will matter on. Um, <laughs> If I do ba, 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 um, five is greater than uh, here. Let's do this. Let's do it over here. If I say uh, five is greater than plus plus four, <coughs> oh. order. Wait, what? What? No, that's not great. Oh, right. Sorry can't do that on a raw number that has to be part of a variable uh, so a equals 4 so greater than plus plus a it's false even though 4 plus 1 is 5 and if I console log a here it's 5 so you might be like wait 5 or well sorry let's change that 
equal equal and I have to restart yeah where'd it go oh, well. cotton stay equal to four uh, five equal equal plus plus a actually this way ah, <laughs> the const sorry let a equals four there we go five equal equal a plus plus okay so this so is five equal to a plus plus false but if I console log a it's a so this might get confusing because you're like well five was five but what's what the version before and let's compare that to the version or the version after and the version four behave differently so if I do it here that one is true so the difference between the two is when they do it it's in the order of operations they're different so if it comes before it's going to do this before it does anything else if it comes after it's going to do pretty much everything else after so in this case it did this comparison so it was essentially like that almost it did the comparison and then it added to a although it, yeah um, and that crazy table probably shows those yeah so we should be able to see plus plus yeah so you can see here plus plus and the before and the after are in different places so uh, that's the only time which one you use matters um, and I just prefer always after if I'm going to use it just because um, and I think think a little more common you actually see both ways quite frequently so but we're going to go with mine um, alright so if we hit the, if we hit the player so we're inside this so we know one of these is the case so if we double check if was it the player we hit if it was we're going to add the score else we're going to add to misses and we could do else if not canvas hit rec dot hit but because we only have two possibilities here and we just eliminated one of those possibilities this has to be the only other possibility uh, so we don't have to it, it's redundant to put that extra if check so now we'll have our scores going on so for now just for a second just to kind of watch them let's just output our score in our console our misses to their console and we watch those okay so zero zero one two three four blah 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 holy crap that is fast oh, but we didn't add anything to my misses intro oh there we go now we're missing things uh, huh our misses is not going up as fast as I would have expected interesting but maybe that's just because I'm impatient and no I guess it's working about right yeah we just had to get more things on the screen so that seems about okay might not be exactly right. It should be, though. Um, but okay, cool. So we have our scores going. So now, uh, obviously, we don't actually want our game to have to have the console open to tell what your score is. So what we'll do, and we can get rid of those because we did that. Let's go to our draw function. And for now, let's just, well, we're going to draw our, our score and our misses to the screen. So we'll go ahead and we'll make new functions for those. So draw score, draw misses, and we're going, we'll call them from here. And again, just like everything else, we may move this somewhere fancier later, but for now, this is good enough. Uh, so draw score. So to draw text with our context, uh, it still uses fill style or stroke style. And one thing about Canvas, is you have to either save and restore the state or you have to set everything every time um, if you're going to do things so well actually we don't need to worry about that for now because we're only going to call fill style we'll talk about that down the line when we get fancy with stuff uh, for right now so f so stroke would basically put an outline around your text fill will give you the regular text so we're going to use fill only uh, whereas on our enemies and player we were using both for here we're just going to use fill and we'll do a dark gray, an almost black color. Then we're going to do context.fillText. And we're going to do, so first it's our text, so score. And actually we'll say score like this. So we'll actually print out the word score. And remember this is a template string, so it's going to swap out our score variable for right here. 
and then we give it an X and a Y. So um, for text, where the X and Y counts is a little bit different um, depending on some settings you have. So if I have, let's go ahead, let's get some text and get it real big here. A, B, C, D, E, F. Okay. So I have my text here. By default, the X is going to be, um, not that. No. Stop. There we go. Okay. Our um, our Y is going to refer, it's alphabetical, let's actually pull it up in here, in MDM, uh, MDM canvas, um, fill text, because I'm hoping they have pictures. I'm not looking for, I want, um, oh, actually, um, MDM canvas uh, text baseline. Do you have a picture? There we go. Cool. We do have a picture. So by default, um, the Y position is set to alphabetical. I've played with it. I've never done. Uh, so according to Bo asked if I've ever played with the OpenGL context, I've played with it in a very experimental way. I've never actually um, like built a real project, although that very likely will be one of our streaming topics at some point, because I would love to play with it. Uh, it's really interesting. Um, yeah, because you can actually do 3D and Canvas, and there are also libraries that let you, that simplify doing that. Um, I think, um, is it 3JS, I think? Is one of the biggies. Yeah, 3JS simplifies it. These are pretty cool. So these are all in a, canvas and they're um they're so like that you can see it's actually rendering it in real time so those are pretty darn cool um but yeah all of the, that's using the 3js library which is built on the uh the opengl context yeah yeah it's 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 definitely significantly more complicated than 2d which is why we're starting with 2d um not to mention just the math that goes into 3D stuff. I hate 3D math. Um, okay, so cool. Um, yeah, so for our text, we got uh, different uh, baselines. So in font, your baseline is basically the line where text is drawn on. So if you think like you're a lined piece of paper that you you know take notes on, your baseline, in air quotes, would be that line on your paper. So. Um, so by default, it's alphabetic, which basically, if you look here, it's basically like kind of the natural line. So it's kind of like the line you would draw, um, you would write on if you were writing on like a piece of notebook paper. Um, then you have middle hanging, which is the, the um, how to describe it? This font actually doesn't demonstrate it very well. Uh, you have top, ideographic, which is the bottom, and then, yeah, let's Let's go find their descriptions of ideographic and stuff. Um, blah, 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 bottom of the body of the characters as the main body protrude beneath you as the baseline. Um, in that, yeah. So, ideographic doesn't consider descenders. Uh, or, yeah. Ideographic doesn't. Bottom does. So, really, the ideographic hanging and alphabetic are more uh, how you would think about it in something like photo or uh, yeah in Photoshop uh, that's more how they're used to thinking about it as a programmer I'm more used to thinking about it in terms of like boxes and rectangles and stuff so I tend to go with either top middle or bottom uh, based on how I want to align it so for a score we're gonna where so we're drawing it on our canvas how am I so light I must have changed the opacity without noticing I did Okay, so here's our canvas. I want to put our score, and I want to have it 10 pixels away from the top and 10 pixels away from the bottom. So really, I'm setting the, the position of it based on the top. So I'm going to do my baseline as top. Uh, so context.text baseline equals top. That way, when I say 10 and 10 here, or, well, this 10 
I'm referring to how much away from the top. Um, and then for your X, you similar to text baseline, you have text align. Text align is a little more straightforward. Uh, I think is it? Yeah, so, let's, so left, right, center, pretty much exactly what you think. Um, start and end are kind of funky and the default is start but I almost never use start because it can cause weird things so um, English and a lot of other especially like Latin languages they always they're generally read left to right other languages are read from right to left so start and end is based on which locale you're on so if I'm in English, I'm, it starts going to refer to the left. But if I'm in, um, uh, what are other what are languages that do uh, do the side or uh, start? Sorry, start from the right. Um, mm, I don't know. It's Chinese. No, I don't think Chinese is one. In no, I don't know. I don't want to say one and be wrong because. Uh, but yeah, but if you have some other language, it might start from the side. So the programmer, again, I'm trying to position that on the screen. So these kind of freak me out because I'm used to thinking in boxes, so rectangles. So I'm going to start with left. So context dot uh, text align equals left. So now when I do x10, I'm the left is scoot o scooched over 10. Um, and then let's go ahead and show that kind of teeny tiny. Um, I can also do context.font style and or sorry context.font font style you can do is it? yeah uh, and this is actually the same as if we were declaring font for CSS Helvetica song serif and how you declare font for CSS is and this is kind of a shorthand and this isn't everything but we have our font size here and then we have for CSS we have a concept of font stack so when your browser renders a font, it's actually using the fonts installed on your computer. And because not every font is installed on every computer, we give it a font stack. So what it'll do, it'll be like, okay, do you have the Arial font? Yes, use that. If not, do you have the Helvetica font? Yes, use that. If not, and it'll keep going down. And I could technically put like 600 fonts here. Um, and then eventually we get to you should have at the end you have a, a special font notice how it's all lowercase there's serif sans serif and mono spaced mono yeah and what these guys are is their fallback so this is basically if I get to this point basically I'm saying use whatever you have as the default sans serif font or if I did serif use whatever you have as the default serif or mono space and for those that aren't familiar with font uh, anatomy so a <coughs> sans serif font is like this one here. A serif font is one like, uh, I'm trying to find one that's a real clear example. So that one looks pretty good. Uh, ABC. So serifs are these little extra little flourishes at the end, these little extra nubs that come out. That's a serif. So serif has those, sans serif doesn't. And then monospace is like the font in our browser in our um, IDE here all in a mono space every single uh, well compare and contrast so like if I do say um, a l i m if you look at those the width of each one of these letters is very different from one another it's kind of all over the place and it changes based on appearance it's like designed to look good um, with a mono space like in our browser every single character lines up exactly with takes up exactly the same amount of width hence mono space each only one space between them so if I do like even that same example a l and my ID is fighting me because this is not real code uh, m you can see all those line up they're all the same width so we use mono space encoding a ton because it makes it a lot easier to read uh, I've written code in with not mono space a few times I don't recommend it um, okay, cool. So I changed our font size down here. Oh, and we don't have to console log that anymore. Change my font size. Have a font stack. Gets a little bigger. There we go. Cool. And now, if I hit it, it'll keep. It'll count because it'll get re-rendered every time because we're in our game loop. Yay! 
So now, let's draw our misses. So misses is going to be pretty similar. The only real difference here is for this guy, I want it to be, instead of here, I want it to be here. Go away. And, uh, I want it to be over here, based on, I want it to be 10 away this way and 10 away this way. So I'm going to do its text align right. That way when I say 10 for X, it's going to put the right at the point that I say. And then I need to change this because um, instead of being 10, which would put it the right edge here, I want the right edge here, which is canvas width minus 10. So we just do canvas width minus 10. There we go. Oop, and let's change our text. Missing misses and misses. All right. And now we have something that kind of sort of looks like a game. So missing, missing, score, score, missing, missing, score. So cool. We got something going on. Let's see, clean something. Yeah, so according to Bo just shared, fun fact, the width unit M in CSS comes from the same unit of measurement from old typesetting and printing, which was literally the width of the character M because it was the most regularly shaped letter. Um, yeah, it's actually pretty interesting. There's um, MDM, uh, blah, 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 units of measurement. Um, is this the one I'm thinking? Yeah, so you can read through all the different um, representations. They actually don't go into the history on this one, though. Uh, but yeah, there's like 50 bajillion different ones. And a lot of these are more familiar to designers than they are coders sometimes. Uh, like, I use a lot of pixel and M. And um, now the viewpoints, viewport stuff, not usually for uh, font sizes necessarily, but for other stuff. Uh, and pixels, and then designers will use either like inches, millimeters, or they'll use point, which is this like totally randomly arbitrary thing. Um, but yeah, but yeah, it's pretty interesting how many there are, and a lot of them have historical stuff and stuff. Um, yeah, cool. So okay, so now we have a game. We can hit the things that randomly generates things. It um, gives us a score, it gives us our misses. So I think that's probably going to be a good point to start wrapping up the stream. We're at a little over three hours now. Um, so what we'll do in the next stream, um, pro which probably won't be tomorrow, the next stream will probably be Friday. Uh, if you follow my, I'm trying to get a regular schedule, but I'm still trying to work out what that regular schedule should be. Um, so for now it's kind of ad hoc, but once I know for sure I'm going to do a stream that day. I'll put it on my Twitter. So and I uh, I'll try to also do the um put a schedule on my my Twitch channel, although I sometimes forget that one. But I'll definitely tweet if I'm going to stream that day. So if you follow me on Twitter, you'll you can um see me doing that or I guess follow me on Twitch and you should be able to too. Um but yeah, so probably Friday what we'll do, we'll keep working on this guy. We'll enhance it. We'll um probably some of the things we'll do We'll add multiple screens. So right now we only have one uh, screen uh, that is the game screen. But, you know, a real game, you would have, like, a start title page, and you'd hit a button, and that would start the game, and then you'd the game would be over, and you'd have a game over, and then you'd have a button to restart. So we'll implement that. Um, and then if we have time, we'll start, um, <coughs> we'll start doing things like we'll make some nicer graphics so it's not just circle and square, and we might even add some sound effects. We'll just kind of... Add whatever sounds fun. So that'll be the next stream, probably on Friday. Um, and then um, I'll push uh, all all codes and all my streams will be on my GitHub account. Um, so I'll be pushing that up shortly. Um, so if you want to download and play with it yourself, feel free. Um, here's the URL. And if you go to the website that we built on the last two streams and go to social, you we have links to everything too. And this website is linked in my Twitch page um, and then um, yeah and then uh, real quick so according to Bo asked are you using a bounding box on your circles for collision and uh, yeah we'll we'll pretty up it's a it's a pretty 
pretty quick screen. Uh, according to Bo just commented that my website is not HTTPS, um, which is a bad thing, but yeah, we'll get it prettied up, although it currently collects no user data, so I don't have to have a, uh, a cookie warning to uh, satisfy the um, whatever that four letter acronym is in Europe so but yeah we'll get we'll get security on there at some point um, but yeah and then uh, you asked if I'm using bounding box on the circle for equation currently yes we are uh, and that might be one of the improvements we do on Friday too we may switch to pixel perfect uh, collision detection instead of bounding box because that will give us a much nicer uh, hit because you can see here if I like sneak up on a circle or a square from the right place I seem to hit it before I actually hit it. Uh, so we'll probably swap that out to pixel perfect. Um, and we'll probably swap out the graphics and stuff. We'll just kind of play around. We'll, uh, whoever is here, they can share their input on what little feature we should add next. But we'll definitely for sure do the, the various screens. So we'll have a start screen and game over screen so we can see how a state machine works. Um, so that'll be the next stream. Uh, this video will go up on, this video will be in my Twitch channel. It'll be on YouTube. Um, shortly, it'll take a while to process and get uploaded, but I should have it up there tonight. Um, yeah, hopefully you enjoyed. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining. Uh, it's really awesome. A lot of you stuck around for quite a while, so thanks for that. Uh, thanks for chatting. Um, you know, if you liked it, uh, you know, follow me on all the fun social media things. I'm not going to list them all out. Uh, you know, do whichever ones you like. Um, and yeah, thanks for streaming. Um, and if anyone has any questions, uh, I'll get our get pushed up. I don't want to really talk about Git just yet, so I'm not going to explain it. But um, well, why not? We'll explain it. So Git, like I mentioned, is version control. So basically, uh, it we're able to take our files and we're going to add them to what's called the commit. Uh, commit is I like to think of it as almost like a uh, kind of checkpoint in your code because it gives you kind of a history of where you are because you can go back to previous commits and stuff. Um, oh, that's a good call out. Thank you, according to both. So let's see. Uh, here's the website with the social links. Um, and you can go to Twitter uh, and you can get to all the Twitter and Instagram links and everything from there. Um, so that's probably the, the easiest. And then you can just go to what you want and my github is linked here so if you want github you can get there um, and this project's github specifically is this guy projects github so that's that's the one that'll actually have this code so I'm gonna commit that code right now so commits are kinda like checkpoints uh, because you can go back in history so it's your way of getting your code into there but it also will keep a history so you can go in there or you can play with it and stuff so um, basically I'm gonna I add everything I stage everything with this add command here and if I do get status everything should be green so these are the things that are gonna go into the commit those are the files I changed and then I do don't strictly have to do dash a if I do add dot but I do it out of habit and then dash M and I put a message so let's see uh, this one we We'll just say, so this is just a message for the commit. Um, it's just a short description of what you did. You can make them real long and multi-line and stuff. I usually keep mine fairly short and sweet. Uh, so we'll just say implemented base game. Well, let's go something like that for now. And then once it's committed, I can see, so origin, so git is a uh, distributed version control system, which means the copy of git I have, or the copy of my project I have, is actually a 100% complete copy of my project, and I can never touch GitHub again, and mine will still work. But GitHub also has a complete copy, and if you go and download on your computer, you have a complete copy and stuff. So that's what it means by distributed. Every single copy of it is a complete copy. Um, but when I want to push up copies code so I can share, you usually you push up to what's called a remote. The default remote is an, is the origin. So origin is in like that's kind of the the main place for the code. That's the um, that's the ba, 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 ba. I can't think of the word. I forgot the word I want. But it's like the main place that that code lives. Uh, in this case, my origin is GitHub. And then it's saying that I have one commit, so I've not pushed up my commit yet. So if I'm push. This is going to push the, the commit I just made, that checkpoint I just made with my latest code, up to origin. And now, if I flip over here, 
we will see all the code we did. So now if you want to download it, um, you would come in here and you would clone the project or download. You can actually just download a zip and then get node installed. If you read through here, do prereqs, get node installed. And then if you just run these three, you'll have the game going. And if you want to work on the game and don't run that one, run this guy and then it'll change automatically like I was doing all through the stream. Um, so yeah, I think that's it. Um, anyone have any questions before we call it a night or anything they want to share in chat? Give it a couple minutes and then yeah. Alright, cool. Don't think anyone's typing. Hopefully I don't cut anyone off. Alright. So again, thanks everyone for joining me. I really appreciate it. Thanks for interacting and stuff. It was a lot of fun for me. Hopefully you guys enjoyed it. Hopefully you guys learned a little bit. I learned some things, which is always fun. Um, you know. Follow my streams. Next stream will probably be Friday. Uh, I'll definitely tweet it as soon as I know for sure if it'll be Friday. And, uh, oh, we're actually at the four-hour mark. I forgot I started this at five. Um, and yeah, thanks. Have a great night, everyone.